Buenas noches, gente. Increíble, Marito. 20 programas <ríe> celebrando a full acá. Sí. Increíble. Increíble, lindo, increíble. ¿no? Con presentación nueva, todo espectacular. La Hermoso. verdad que es espectacular. Acá Hermoso tengo... todo. Y nada, estamos cumpliendo estos 20 programas, ¿no? 20 programas divertidos, con un montón de anécdotas que tenemos, ¿no? De, de los que nos dejó. Eh, este casi año completo de, de más de un año completo de, de, de entrevistas increíble pero casi es, dos años casi dos es, años completos si vamos si, mirá, si vamos eh, a, a digamos a los números a los a las fechas es casi un año casi, casi un, un año, año que, casi un año que llevamos haciendo esto porque creo que el mes que viene eh, hubiese sido la primera de Orway sí exactamente el mes que viene hubiese sido el de Orway y la verdad que fue hermoso, divertidísimo. Y lo muchas gracias, Panfle. Muchas gracias, gracias Panfle. Panfle. El señor de Palar Fino Takes acá. Fino. El señor Esteban Calvi, otro Calvi. gran. Acá la, ah, la Agus, un capo. Ahí le gustó la intro, le gustó la intro. Sí, ¡Eh! está buena la intro. Está bien. Caselita. Caselita, Caselita. Sí, sí. Manuel, Manuel Marcelo. Gracias. Y bueno, y a todos los que, a los que siempre están. Y los que también nos ven así de escondidos, sí. los, 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 que, los que tienen miedo de que los sorprendan con las manos en la masa, ¿no? Los que miran de reojo, ¿viste? Los que miran de reojo, ¿viste? Gracias, Gracias, Javi. Un abrazo grande. Este, a, para, de, esto se le digamos a todos ellos, a todos los que están, a los que nos miran de como si fuera una sí. escondida, y a, para los que... No, no, no es que hay, hay, y también para aquellos, para aquellos que... Y los que nos ven diferido. Que, los que miran en, en diferido con subtítulos. También. Tienen subtítulos. Tienen subtítulos los programas en inglés. Tienen subtítulos los programas. Algunos no, porque obviamente son los que, los que hacemos en castellano. Pero bueno, lo, pero la mayoría eh, están... No, bueno, la mayoría no, todos. Todos todos, son, todos, todos. todos A todos le pongo subtítulos. Salvo Por las dudas. En español. Por las dudas. Uh -huh. este, Por las dudas. Yo la verdad que me siento totalmente eh, bendecido por este programa. Bendecido porque tener, tener la posibilidad de, de, de digamos, de, de hablar con estos tipos, con estos grandes, estos grandes del cómic, y que estos uh -huh. grandes del cómic hablen con uno, este, y que ustedes desde el chat puedan comunicarse con ellos, y que nosotros tengamos la posibilidad de acercárselos, es este, es, eh, no, para mí no tiene precio. Sé que muchos no lo, quizás no lo ven así, sé que muchos no lo aprecian. No. Eh, por ahí, eh, digamos, tiene que ver más que nada con, no sé si con el amor al cómic o con, con, digamos, con el amor al, al medio, más que nada. Este, pero hay gente que no lo aprecia, no, no, no le interesa, se nota que no le interesa y se notan en los números. Nota, no puede ser que un video, un video de Sandman este, por ahí supere un video de protagonista del cómic. Eso no puede ser. Sí. Y eso sucede, eso sucede, sucede, puede ser el impedimento de, del idioma, puede ser este, otras cosas, pero la realidad es que feliz, feliz de poder estar y totalmente agradecido, totalmente agradecido, y esto lo digo públicamente, eternamente agradecido, de que el protagonista del cómic no sea yo solo, sea también el señor Mario Lusuriaga. No, 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 no. Porque el protagonista del cómic, protagonista del cómic, no existiría si no fuera por él tampoco. ¿eh? Porque no. el que. Ahora vamos a contar la anécdota, Mario. Ahora contamos la anécdota. Van a contar una anécdota. Ahora contamos la anécdota. No, si es no... un placer, es un placer, porque nosotros disfrutamos de lo que leímos y estar acá con. con, que este, con, con, con hablando con grandes de, de los que. Como nosotros, yo siempre digo, y que quedó como una frase del programa, que los héroes son ellos, ¿no? No solo lo, lo, los lo Superman Batman, sino en realidad son ellos los que los que ponen vida a todo eso. Este, es un honor para mí, un honor de, de poder leer, de estar, este, oh, mira, de poder de. Oh, puso la tara, puso, puso la tara, pusiste la tara, cabrón. Puso la viva. Puso Mira, la viva. Había descuento, había descuento con. Flete Mira, Daniel. Un abrazo así, así, así enorme. Flete Daniel, Daniel, si te tenés que mudar, 
Ahí ¿En tenés, serio? Flete ¿Fuera de Daniel. Broma? ¿Fuera de broma? ¿Flete Daniel? Ahí. Así, lo, lo abrazamos así. No, 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 no. Y ya ha mandado fotos, ha mandado fotos. Con sí, ha mandado fotos. De, a, de mudanzas a comiqueros conocidos, así que sí, cualquier comiquero sí, sí, que sí. tenga que mudarse, Flete Daniel. Flete Daniel, dale. Te va, te va a tratar con amor los cómics. Sí, por lo, por <ríe> lo, lo menos, menos seguro. Te... Por lo menos te lo vas a tratar con amor. No como a mí sí. que me tiraban las cajas y se me caían, ¿no? Pero este. Claro, no, hijos de puta. Bueno, eh, pero no, un placer. Y la verdad es que eh, el, el acercamiento y la llegada con todos los muchachos, ya sea con Demia, con, con sí. Kyle, con Agus, con todo lo demás, me, me, me introdujo a un mundo hermoso en el cual nunca podría haber, nunca podría haber charlado y tener una amistad, generar una amistad a la que tenemos. Así que la verdad es que eso es. Bravo. ¡Oh! Wow. Buah, otro, man, que vaya, la, vaya, 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 otro que puso la tarasca y se otro que puso la tarasca a los Lantern Corps. Pero bueno, lo que hacemos, eh, lo que hacemos como, como siempre decíamos, eh, con Justicieros, con, con, con Demian en Crisis, con, con, con Kyle, con Aus y con todos los demás, es dar un contenido diver, divertido, nos, nos divertimos. Y eso, eso es lo, lo, lo que hacemos. Tra trabajamos y nos divertimos. <risa> pero, pero no, no, feliz, feliz de estar acá, de, de conocer un montón de, de, de historias copadas, de historias que a uno, uno los pareció perdidas hace mucho tiempo, de, de, de mudanzas y demás, que se tiran cosas y demás, y ahora uno las vuelve a recuperar. Eso es, eso es maravilloso. Y eso es lo que hace esto. Y lo que humildemente tratamos de hacer es que la gente se aboque y que lea. Que, que te pierdes unos minutitos para leer, para leer, sobre todo para leer, porque eso es lo más interesante de todo esto. Mirá, yo te voy a decir algo, este, yo creo que si hay algo que tendría que despertar, tendría que despertar justamente como consecuencia de lo que vos decís. ¡No, wow, ¡Ah! Daniel, no, no. Un aplauso para Frente Daniel, otro Lantern Corps, pero están... Otro, otro miembro de Por favor, por favor. Un honor, muchísimas gracias, muchísimas gracias a todos, a Daniel, a Xavi, oh. a Laus, por, a, por apoyar esto y por justamente darle este apoyo a este tipo de contenido. Porque uh -huh. como decía Mario, como decía Mario, una cosa lleva a la otra. Esto que decía Mario de la lectura, la lectura te lleva a vos a conocer a los autores y te lleva a querer conocer a esos autores y, uh -huh. o a esos, a esos artistas y es, 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 esto es protagonista del cómic protagonista uh -huh. del cómic es eso es decir, che, estoy leyendo la muerte de Superman y Jerry Orway que estuvo ahí que la dibujó o estoy leyendo Power of Shazam <risa> y que dibujó, tiró la idea de mátenlo al tipo <risa> claro, mátenlo que dijo mátenlo al tipo este... Está ahí, está ahí. Y vos Acá podés hacerle las preguntas. O sea, uh -huh. el, 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 digamos, siempre fue concebido protagonista del cómic como algo para que la gente tenga, o los comiqueros, la gente, sí, la gente y los comiqueros tengan acceso a ellos. Como siempre digo, nosotros estamos muy lejos para poder tener acceso a ellos. Y en, en época de pandemia, peor... Que... No solo eso, sino mira que nosotros la, re, la rema, él, yo sé lo que la rema cae todo el tiempo a la hora de, de y sin chapear a nadie, sin porque, porque es lo que sucede en este medio, que hay mucha gente que chapea con, con los estudios, con, los, con la gente que tiene las licencias y todo lo demás, y teniendo ese poder no lo hace, y nosotros que somos chiquitos, que no hacemos nada, lo, se, se hace, es un... Pijón, como me gusta decir a mí. Es, un, es, un, es algo copado, ¿no? Pero, y acá hay una realidad, Mario. Maravilla. Siempre lo decimos, lo dijiste vos. Esto lo hacemos para divertirnos, claro. para pasarnos, pasarla bien nosotros, para sí, este, disfrutar nosotros. Y como siempre digo, y soy una re egoísta lo que voy a decir, pero esto primero lo hago por mí, para mí disfrute, porque amo el cómic, y me encanta este, hablar con tipos como Johnny Orway, o con cualquier eh, cre creativo del cómic, y que me cuente cómo empezó, cómo es, ese, es, es, es esas historias, cómo, 
qué, qué, qué obstáculos tuvo o este, le vamos a pedir seguramente ¿Qué lo motivó? Cosas. ¿Qué lo, ¿Qué lo motivó, motivó a hacer esa historia? Las anécdotas, las anécdotas que tiene eh, eh, Orway conoció a Kirby. Tiene una anécdota Kirby. que le voy a pedir, por favor, contala de la anécdota cuando fueron a Speakeasy, a los, al Speakeasy. ¿Te acordás que fue sí. con, que le contaba toda la historia de, de, justamente de, 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 de la vida de él? O sea, sí, señor. esas cosas eh, no se ven todos los días. Y vos en una convención no tenés tampoco la posibilidad de, de, de hacerlas. No tenemos el tiempo tampoco, así que... Pero bueno, me motiva me motiva que en esta nueva normalidad ayer pude, pude estar en un evento chiquito, ah, el pero evento en sí, pero evento en sí, y ya me motivó en decir, loco, hablar, hablar con editoriales, mando un saludo a la gente de Loco Rabia que nos trató muy bien, que saludó a Cris y que nos saludó a vos, a mí... Así que, nada, un montón de cosas que, 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 que te das cuenta que hacemos por las cosas, que nos ven, la gente nos ve. Estamos ahí a full con todo. Entonces, sí, eso está bueno. Fomentar lectura, fomentar todo lo que se viene y eso, eso me viene bárbaro. Y yo, yo estoy feliz porque supongo que el año que viene, ya cuando dijeron la, no, la, la fecha del, de lo que va a ser Argentina Comic Con, vamos a estar ahí todos, ahí divirtiéndonos, ¿no? Claro, imagínate, imagínate ahí, ¿no? En la Comic Con pudiendo hacer algo, algo juntos, este, ahí en, en vivo, ¿no? En vivo, ¿Sí? en vivo. Acá está Pam. Gracias, Pam. Genial total, genial total. Este, pero bueno, Mario, mira, este, faltando 15 minutos para que seguramente se haga pre, sea presencia el señor Orway. ¿Por qué no contás un poquito cómo empezó el protagonista del cómic? ¿Cómo empezó? ¿Cómo empezó? ¿Protagonista del cómic? Vos no sabías nada. No sabía nada. En un momento estábamos hablando de qué hacer, como siempre hacemos los, los, los canales, ¿qué hacemos? Y vamos a hacer esto, vamos a hacer lo otro. Siempre planeamos de antemano, tenemos planeado una grillita, de una grillita entre nosotros, porque es un lío coordinar un montón de cosas porque tenemos vida. <risa> pasamos de la base tenemos vida, tenemos laburo y tenemos un montón de cosas pero eh, me dice yo sabés que tengo ganas de hacer algo me dice, ¿qué, qué tenés ganas de hacer? tengo ganas de revivir una, una sección que yo tenía en un en, en, no sé si era un blog o era en un en, en un, un grupo un blog, en un blog, un blog. que era entrevistar a, a, a este, guionistas y dibujantes ¿Ah? Le digo, yo, mira qué buena idea. Che, ¿y qué quieres tener en mente? Y no sé, vamos a ver. Vamos a ver, tengo ganas de encarar a alguien. Bueno, quedó bueno, bárbaro. Qué bueno, genial. Empezamos a ver qué íbamos a hacer la otra semana. Y en un momento me dice, ya tengo el primer protagonista del combo. Y le digo, no me digas, ¿y quién es? Jerry Orwell. Cuando me dijo Jerry Orwell, dije, no me digas. ¿Y qué onda? Y, no, re buena onda, yo la verdad pero quiero que vos estés conmigo haciéndolo. Bueno, buenísimo, bárbaro. Más o menos nos defendemos con el inglés entre los dos. <risa> Tratamos de... Hacemos lo que podemos. Hacemos lo que podemos. Y bueno, dale. ¿Qué día? Y era noviembre, era después de mi cumpleaños, después de ese poco, eh, la semana del año pasado, en noviembre, y me dijo, bueno, tal día, qué sé yo, bueno. Y no nos daba la fecha, no nos daba la fecha. Y en un momento nos, nos dice, ¿eran las 10 de la noche? No, 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 pará. Nos dio la fecha. Nos dio la fecha. Y vino, vino el huracán, ¿te acordás? Sí, no, vino el huracán, vino un huracán que le, le, cagó, le cagó la comunicación y el día. Le tiró todo, le tiraron, tiró todo por la zona donde estaba él, todos claro. los palos de... De, digamos, de, 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 de línea, de, de todo eso, y no estuvo, estuvo incomunicado, perdió, perdió, este, digamos, comunicación, perdió este, electrodomésticos, tremendo, fue tremendo, sí, fue, fue, y la tuvo que no. pasar, la tuvimos que pasar, dijo, bueno, yo te aviso cuando puedo, claro. y bueno, y quedó, y quedó ahí en la nebulosa. Ahora Así la nada. Se y en un momento... Agarran y, llaman por, y, me, y yo estaba, estaba acá en casa, bueno, estamos en plena pandemia, ya estamos, estamos ya llegando a diciembre, ¿viste? Que te acordás que estábamos todos un poquito más, 
no te digo, estábamos todos relajados, pero estábamos más o menos. Ya estábamos. Y ya estábamos, ya estábamos ya estamos, diciendo, ya bueno, estamos, mirá bueno. que van a venir, van a venir las van a venir las vacunas. Ah, mirá, qué bueno, pa, 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 bueno. Se eh, hace Argentina días, Comic Con de fin de año, ¿no? Se hace sí, Argentina Comic Con. Después me acuerdo que. Ah, no, dice, fue en septiembre de 10 de septiembre de 2020. No, no puede ser. ¿Sí? Puede ser, puede ser. Ah, te decía, puede ser, entonces. Vos te decía que estábamos ahí en un, a un año Bueno, de... cuestión de que... Entonces, entonces no fue para el cumpleaños, fue antes. Eh, y me acuerdo que, bueno, él habló y yo estaba, bueno, me voy a acostar, le estábamos hablando de... No me acuerdo de qué era, de qué era que estábamos hablando, una boludejera. Y... No estábamos y... hablando. No, no estábamos, no, pero antes habíamos hablado, che, me voy a ver no sé qué mierda hoy, te dije, y me, y me iba a acostar porque mañana tenía que laburar. Y... Sí, chequeo con el video, dice 10 de septiembre, bueno, está bien, de hace un año. Y de abuso ahí. Me, me acuesto, estaba mirando, ¿no? estaba mirando una boluda y digo, ping, teléfono. ¿Qué pasó? Orwell, que era las 10, ¿no? 10 y media. Claro, tiene, eh, él tiene una hora menos que nosotros. Eran 10 y media de la noche. Eran 11 y media de la noche. 11 de no, la noche. no, no. No, perdón, no, 10 y media de la noche. 10 y, 10 y media de la noche era. Y en sí. la noche nosotros. Sí. Y en un momento... Hola, Dagman. ¿Qué hace, Dagman? Y en un momento me dice... Che, Uruguay quiere salir ahora, a las 11. Yo le digo... ¿En serio, ya? Sí, me dice... Pero si no podés, Marito, no hay problema. No, 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 dale, dale, dale. Agarré, me levanté, me fui, me hice un té, me levanté, lo pusimos acá. Vamos, vamos. Y estuvimos como hasta las 1 y pico, 2 de la mañana hablando con Uruguay. A todo esto yo cuento mi parte. Yo... Buenísimo. Entonces. Agarro, le digo, tipo, 10 de la noche, digo, voy a escribir a ver cómo anda el señor Orwell, qué sé yo. ¿Cómo le va, señor Orwell? ¿Qué te... eh, dígame si alguna vez este, usted puede, qué sé yo. Sí. ¿Puedes ahora? ¿Eh? <risa> no. ¿Cómo? ¿Cómo? Sí, 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 sí. Y yo agarré, ¿cómo decirle no a Jerry Orwell? Entonces agarré y le dije, listo, Mario. Mario, ya está. Mario, tenés que, tenés que levantarte, tomaste un té, hace algo, dale. Sí, me levanté, me un té y... Yo me acuerdo que, me, acuerdo que me, me levanté, me levanté y no tenía ni, ni programa preparado. Este, ar, armé, el programa, armé el programa a medida que íbamos haciendo la entrevista con él. Sí, 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 este, sí, 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 ah, sí, sí. Y hablar Pero con fue él. Divertido, fue divertido. Cuando apareció, cuando apareció. Cuando apareció Éramos cuando... dos colegiales. Eh, Explotó todo, explotó todo porque este, Orway, no sé si con, con, coincidas conmigo, pero se nota que tiene un amor por el cómic, por el medio. Sí. Lo irradia, lo irradia. Y cuando, sí, vos, sí, lo, sí. cuando vos lo ves, es como que absorbes todo eso, absorbes todo eso. Hoy cuando lo vean no vean, van a ver que el chabón es un fenómeno, es, es sí, un fenómeno sí. con todo lo que vamos a hablar, porque hoy, vamos a, hoy no vamos a hacer una... Hoy vamos a, vamos a hablar de cómics, obviamente, pero vamos a estar sí. más relajados, más... Porque como es la número 20, y aparte él, él, él fue el primero, entonces bueno, vamos a estar charlando, y aparte tuvimos una fallida ahí, que se le cortó internet. Es verdad, es verdad. Y no pudimos terminar, hacer, no pudimos terminar es saludarlo. Verdad. Es verdad, ese día justamente se le cayó por eso que estamos hablando. Porque de nuevo le agarró el temporal y ¡pum! se le cayó el internet. Y, nos, y quedó ahí cort, quedó colgado y nosotros quedamos, bueno, listo, chao. Y ahora, <ríe> y ahora, y bueno, y ahora fue que después vino el señor este, Darryl Banks, después vinieron, empezaron a venir todos, cada uno, y bueno, y ahí hasta el día de hoy, ¿no? Sí, 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 la verdad que eh, es una sección que amo. Es una sección que amo, lo vuelvo a repetir porque vale la pena. Vale la pena. <risa> Oiga, el señor el Greco. 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 Este, y seguramente voy a seguir haciéndola, voy a seguir tratando de, de traer este, a, a más gente, a más guionistas, más eh, artistas. Logramos tener a los más contemporáneos, logramos a tener a Bruno Redondo últimamente. Uh -huh. Nos levantamos a las. 4 de, de la mañana. Para hablar por, con el señor Bruno Redondo para que ustedes tengan el... Mirá. Me acuerdo habla, el programa de Matei. 
El de Mateis. El de Mateis, el de Mateis fue Mateis. Incre increíble, el de Mateis. Muy bueno. Una cosa hermosa. Una el error Friends estaba buenísimo, que nos mostró el, el Thunder Strike de... El Thunder Strike, para así decirlo, ¿no? El mazo el de Thunder Strike, claro. El mazo de Thunder Strike, increíble. Los dos te lo tenían, ¿no? Los dos tenía uno Los de dos Falco, lo tenían un mazo. Uno de Falco y uno de él. Tenían. Uno de tenía Falco, dos. bueno, Tom de Falco también estuvo. Bueno, eh, el día que estuvo... Eh, eh, ¿Quién? Ah, a ver, ahí nos dice Xavi. ¿Cuáles ver, serían... Se le lee. ¿Cuáles serían los tres guionistas o dibujantes que no entrevistaron que les gustaría entrevistar? Espero que no me esta pregunta, no sugiero. No, no importa. Eh, ¿Quién me gustaría? Y a mí me gustaría Tom King, por ejemplo, ¿no? Pero eh, a mí me gustaría Tom King. Bueno. Eh, bueno Taylor, que nos gustaría. Oh, la Doc. Genia total, la Doc. La Doc que me sugiere. Eso, Martín, ahí otro. Otro Martín, grande. Un abrazo. Gracias, Martín. Gracias por el apoyo. Sí, John Bank también me gustaría. Me encantaría. Bueno, hay algunos chicos que son este, súper complejos. Súper sí. complejos de contactar. Este Tom King, por ejemplo, eh, es uno de los que a mí también me gustaría. Eh, bueno, Taylor, eh, dijimos. La, la Doc había, había sugerido a John Romita Jr. John Romita ¿Por Jr. No? ¿Por, ¿Por qué no? no? Tom Williamson Taylor, lo dice, ¿eh? Williamson, Williamson, sí, me gustaría, sí. John Byrne, obvio, es cómo no. Eh, a mí me encantaría volver a entrevistar, pero este lo entrevisté yo solo en su momento, y es Alan Davis. Alan Davis Alan es Davis. un fenómeno, la verdad que es un fenómeno, de verdad. Eh, bueno, ¿quién? acá están pidiendo a Dan Jorgens. Dan, Dan Jorgens, bueno. Dan, Dan es uno de los difíciles. Es lo difícil. Esto es un secreto que le voy a contar. Es uno de los difíciles. Es uno de los sí, difíciles. Señor. Es muy eh, difícil. ¿A quién me gustaría eh, volver a Por entrevistar? Más. Otro que me gustaría volver a entrevistar a mí es Frank Miller, pero bueno, es, es, también es de los difíciles. Es de eh, los difíciles. Son las figuritas eh, difíciles que vos decís. Sí, sí, eh, sí. Bueno, si me toca, me toca en el, en el paquete, la pego, ¿viste? En el álbum. Wade también nos gustaría. Wade, pero... Wade, Wade puede ser. Alex Ross, acá dicen... La figura, no, acá, Alex Ross. Ojalá. ¿Sí? Ojalá. No, es un, nada. No, explota todo. Eh, yo te digo que... <risa> ya, digamos, ya, ya hubo un par de cosas que hicimos que la verdad que fueron excelentes. Y ni, ni yo me puedo creer, ¿no? Este, bueno, acá. Sí, Paul, sí, Levitt, Paul Levitt. El maestro Paul fue, Levitt. Fue... fue... Fue la el, de, el maestro la... Paul Levitt, dejémosla ahí. Dejémosla, dejémosla ahí. Que miren, que miren la entrevista y después. Sí, que como, la entrevista. Dejé, sí, como dejé, el gato. Dejé, que miren la entrevista y que saquen sus conclusiones, pero el maestro Paul Levitt. Paul Levitt, sí, pero estuvo, pero estuvo, estuvo presente, un fenómeno. ¿Qué nos gustaría? Eh, Tom McFarland nos gustaría. Tom uh, McFarland nos gustaría. Me encantaría. Me encantaría Tom McFarland nos encantaría. Sería, sería este, muy enriquecedor hablar con Tom McFarlane. Sí, para hablar de Batman, de hablar de Spawn, hablar de Spider-Man, hablar de todo lo que ha hecho Tom McFarlane. Eh, Mark Wolfman, bueno, sí. No. Mark Wolfman, Mark Wolfman. Lo que pasa es claro, que Straczynski nos dice acá la doc. Mark Wolfman, Mark Wolfman, por ejemplo, este, había aceptado, esto es, le estoy contando una infidencia, había aceptado pero eh, con el tema de que se empezaron a abrir las convenciones, no, eh, se, se le llenó la, la agenda. Entonces, este, Pérez, no, olvídate. Pérez, no. Este, ya te digo, se retiró. Jim Lee, no, tal vez. Mirá, inclusive hubo un momento que tuvimos la oportunidad, y esto no, esto no lo sabes, Mario, lo que te voy a no. contar ahora. Casi, casi tenemos acá a Drew Struzan. ¡Uy, oh, hijo de... ¿Por Trusan? qué eso tan hijo de mí? ¿Por qué? Bueno, Drus Trusan lo tuvimos ahí y no, no se pudo. Bueno, ya vengo, vamos eh. a insistir. Ya vengo, ya vengo. Vamos a insistir con Drus Trusan, el gran, gran dibujante de póster de películas que no. Y alguno que ya no esté vivo, y bueno, Stan Lee, Kirby, me hubiese gustado mucho. Sí. Sí, oh, bueno, sí. De Steve Vico, de Neonil. 
A que me gustaría es Neil Adams, por ejemplo, pero... Y Neil Adams es complicado porque... Jerry Conway oh, también es complicado. Pasa, pasa todo por el señor Billetín, me parece. Claro. Jerry Conway también. Jerry Conway de... sí, es complicado. Van a hablar de Punisher y demás. Gardenis también. Gardenis. Uh, sería una locura. Gardenis. Eh, ¿Qué más? No sé. ¿A ustedes quién les gustaría? ¿Qué más? Porque también queremos la palabra del pueblo, a ver quién les gustaría. Porque... A ver si nos tienen alguna idea. También. Entre Kane y Finger. Sí, hacer un reencuentro entre Kane y Finger. Finger lo cachetea a Bob Kane. Sin duda. Eh, Adams es complicado. Sí, Neil Adams es complicado. Eh, lo que hicieron con Ron Friends fue lo más. Sí, bueno, estuvo buenísima la, la entrevista con Ron Friends. Un divino. Un divino total, Ron Friends. No, bueno. Ron, lo de Ron Friends eh, a mí me encantó. Fue para mí una de las. Sí, muy linda. Donde... La, esa y la de Tom de Falco fueron una de las más enriquecedoras que tuvimos eh, a nivel... Este, ah, Manapul, no, bien, Manapul. Bueno, Manapul, bueno, bueno, bueno sí. sí, está bien, está bien. Roger Stan, bueno. Pero... Roger Stan, Roger Stan eh, podría ser... Podría, podría ser, ser no. bueno, Grant Morris, bueno, bueno. ¿Quién no Gran, quiere? Pará, pará, esto, esto, doy fe, si alguno, si alguno, si alguno, ¿Sabe cómo contactarlo a Gran, claro, Gran Morris? Me, me manda un mensaje y lo contacto. Neil Gaiman, mira, Neil Gaiman, eh, mmm, posiblemente por algunos contactos que tengo en Netflix, pero no sé, no sé, pero no sé. Hay que ver por el tema de la serie de Sandman, no sé. Tomás, sí, sí, también. Nick Spencer nos dice. Eh, bueno, tuvimos. Bueno, tuvimos pero y... la Doc quiere todos los de Spider-Man. ¿Qué quiere? Llena no, no, no. el álbum de Spider-Man. Claro. <risa> eh, eh, ¿Quién tuvimos? Bueno, tuvimos. Porter estaría bueno. Eh, sí. No sé no sé cómo está eh, Howard Porter. Eh. Porque yo hace Howard poquito... Porter, el de Coso, el de los Nighthawk. No, sí. El de Flash. El de Flash. El de Flash. Porque yo hace poquito me enteré. No, este que... era Howard Shaking. Pero era medio medio Howard Cheeky. Howard Cheeky es eh, bastante complicado. compliquetti. Lo conocimos en el Comic Con. En el Comic Con, claro. Uh -huh. este, acá. Eh... <risa> Romita Senior. Senior. Ro esa quería Romita Junior. Esa quería Romita Junior. Quería Romita Junior. Pero, pero no se puede. Que no está mal para hablar de, de, de Daredevil, por ejemplo. Spider-Man. Sí, totalmente. Uh -huh. Y bueno, señores. Acaba, acaba de está? conectarse el señor, la leyenda, la leyenda Mayer, viviente, no la leyenda viviente de Jerry Orway. Está acá, ahí ¿no? lo estoy viendo, ahí lo estoy viendo al señor Jerry Orway. No oh, lo puedo creer que lo tenemos de nuevo en el canal. El este, regreso de Jedi. Así que bueno, eh, vamos a empezar a hablar en inglés. Vamos a empezar a hablar en inglés. Discúlpenos. Eh, pero bueno, pero bueno. La Empezamos la entrevista. We're here in our 20th protagonistas del cómic. Eh, big celebration for, for us here. And it's a real pleasure to have the man who start everything here. Yes. Who start, who start the, this, the, universe. This, this universe. This universe. This universe. This universe. <laughs> Mr. Jerry or way. Thank you. How you doing, sir? <laughs> Hello, Mr. Orway. Hello there. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Thank you, sir. Thank you for for stop here. It's 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 amazing. It's amazing to have you here, sir. We, we're a huge fans of you, and uh, we can't believe you have we have you in again in, <laughs> again here. <laughs> In, in our channel and have the chance to speak with you about everything about comics I'm glad to be here. it's it's awesome it's awesome Sir, how are you uh, after the, this pandemic how are you doing pretty good um fully vaccinated uh 
everybody here, you know, in my family has been been vaccinated. So we're uh, we're being cautious. We're still wearing masks and things. But, uh, you know, lucky that we passed through all this, you know, kind of pretty much unscathed. Yes, we, we too here in Argentina, too, we are all vaccine, so. Here people in the chat are saying hello to Mr. Oway. Hello, Mr. Oway from Manuel García Muro, from Divan de los Héroes. Give a warm welcome to Jerry Oway. People are thrilled that you're here back <laughs> you're here back back <laughs> to celebrate our 20th uh, show and uh, first of all first of all i would like to ask you a favor that for me it would be an honor and it would be that you would be the godfather of our show <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> It's, Thank you, it's, sir. <laughs> it's the best. It's the best thing that uh, that we can we can uh, uh, we can want from uh, some somebody like you because, like I said, uh, everybody loves Jerry Orway. <laughs> <laughs> sir, you know. Uh, Nowadays in, in, in our country are going, are reprinting a lot of uh, a lot of material of DC materials all the classics. Uh, one one of them is uh, the power of Shazam, your stories. So it, I'm really glad because I don't have it. So I, I <laughs> hope I'll have it <laughs> right now. That's cool. So it's it's cool. <laughs> it's very very cool to 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 read Shazam, of course. Yeah, since you you know Jerry, since the last time we we spoke uh, here in Argentina, they they published a lot of material from from you. Like for example, Zero Hour. Here we have the Argentinian oh, cool. edition yes. yeah. from Zero Hour with your art. Yes, here. and you know they have uh, um, uh, another cover. That it was showed uh, that uh, it was showed in the Argentinian version in the, in the first time, but it didn't came out because the the editorial closed, so the publisher closed. And oh. They couldn't they couldn't <laughs> release the the zero hour story, so they they put another cover and they they released this edition of uh, a few months ago, I think. Huh. Yeah. What's, also, yes. they also they published Crisis on Infinite Earth. Do you remember oh, cool. when we, we spoke about this? When you <laughs> you you told us that you you did a a mug with the with the illustration of this right of this one right that was From, um, I inked um, uh, my brain Nicola gone. Scott Nicola, Nicola Scott. Scott and it was a box for like a collection of uh, like five hardcovers. Mm -hmm. So the box art was very, it was kind of unwieldy. I mean, it was really big because the box was going to be pretty big. So I mm -hmm. think that image probably has most of the drawing, but not all of it. <clears throat> no. It has a couple of uh, missing parts because it, because it has the, the, the center. Right. Here is right some part missing. Right, it was like a wide, yeah. Yes, and, and you and you show us that you did that that drawing uh, to to a cup to a coffee cup. Oh yeah, I yeah. remember you show us uh, you show <laughs> us the cup with with the right. all the all the draw. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, you can make yeah. anything, you know, with a good image. You can make. There's so many websites that will do cups, and I just did a couple of puzzles of uh, a, a commission I drew years ago, but I uh -huh. thought I have a couple of friends of mine who really like puzzles. So I thought it would be like a good gift, you know? Um, but you can, you know, you can make pretty much anything. It, there's so many, uh, so many websites that you can send, you know, that you could get uh, things made. You can make prints, you can make canvas, like 
gigantic paintings, you know, like something that was printed on canvas. Um, you can make giant blankets. It's it's kind of yeah. crazy. I mean, you can make your own <laughs> merchandise. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, I know. You you gotta have the the the, the invention to to think and hey, let's <laughs> let's do this with this image. Right. <laughs> Maybe we don't have that. Maybe we don't have that. Well, but, if you have, I mean, it, the thing with comics is generally they're taller than they are wide. But so, like when I made that cup, I used that that artwork because it was very wide, and I thought, well, that would actually wrap around a cup. So it was it was like the perfect, <laughs> uh, you know, perfect use of it. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm watching you. I, I, I can't stop watching the, the back of oh. your or your studio, <laughs> but you have all the. <laughs> All, all the the action, the Shazam action figures. All the, all the Shazam family, right? The yep, Marvel yep. family. <laughs> It's have, amazing. Uh, you can't. I guess you can see part of that wall. I have some Superman yes. ones. This one is the Shazam. Um, I just ch I changed. I figured I'd show a different angle on the studio, yes. so I put the camera in a different spot this time. My <laughs> computer monitor is got some of my art going as a screensaver right now so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like jerry ardway land <laughs> yeah, yeah of course of yes, course, of course. <laughs> and so, something is jerry ardway reads marvel because yes yeah, reads marvel <laughs> there's a couple of <laughs> hard cover there <laughs> you see my hard covers right the Yeah, yeah, these, and yeah. a lot of uh, records. You have a uh, you love music. A lot of CDs, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's only part of it. I have so much music. Um, oh. I have movies. I have just tons of stuff. I mean, mo more than I need. But I could open my own, you know, video store. What what kind of music do you do, do you uh, listen uh, I, when you're doing the 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 commissions or or the or, or the stories? Well, I, I tend to, I mean, it, sometimes if I'm writing, I'll, t I'll listen to a soundtrack or classical music. Um, like when I was doing Shazam, I listened to a lot of Fred Astaire, uh, you know, musical oh. stuff from the oh. 30s. Um, stuff that would just get you in a mood. Uh, but mostly when I'm drawing, I listen to, I mean, I go through phases where I, I kind of, discover a band that's been around for a while but i'm an old guy so you know sometimes it's a matter of one of my kids saying oh you should listen to this and so re currently i'm i'm listening to a lot of weezer <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, know sir, we 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 talk with we we kind of a lot of things and i i said to him the, the best thing to read um to read the crisis on yeah. the earth so sorry mario Here, people, I ask him, I want the full Jerry <laughs> room tour. <laughs> looks awesome. I think most of most of the people wants to live with you there. <laughs> It's a, yeah. I have a big I have a big space, so I have a, a yes. tall ceiling. I have a bunch of toys up here. I have paintings up here. I don't know if I can actually. Let me see if I oh. locked this down. If I if I haven't locked it down. I should be able to. So if you can look up. Oh, I have, I have paintings, I that. I have artwork up there. Oh, oh look at that cover. <laughs> From the Return of Superman. The Return of Superman. Is, I, have, I have way too much stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I see you, a, a particular family with four. <laughs> Of four. <laughs> <laughs> I have, right. I, I like those statues a lot. I bought those. I love it. Um, they did a really nice, it was around, I want to say like late 90s, mm -hmm. maybe 90, <clears throat> 97, 98, somewhere around there. I, I think they started doing the statues. I really liked the, the Randy Bowen designed them and mm -hmm. sculpted them. And uh, he did, there's a really nice Iron Man. There's, you know, Daredevil, all the stuff that I grew up reading when I was a kid. Yes. Um, yes. The, the yellow, the yellow Daredevil. Right, right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's the greatest. Yeah. Uh, uh, 
so you are a, a collector of, of a lot of things. For uh, for example, you, you said movies, records, yep. uh, action <laughs> figures, comics. Are you yeah, still uh, I have a lot of comics. comics? I have. Um, <clears throat> I collect the uh, mostly Marvel comics from when I was a kid. Um, so I have a lot of the 60s stuff. I don't have complete, you know, uh, complete series or whatever, but I have uh, stuff starting probably in the early 60s, maybe 65, 66, because I started buying comics, Marvel comics. I think I started collecting in 1967. So, so <clears throat> you know, that's so long ago, but I still have stuff up on probably up through the 90s and 2000s that... Uh, I just don't care as much about that stuff as I do the stuff that I think happened during my childhood and my teens, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But I do, I mean, I, I like, I like comics. I like, you know, I mean, I'm in a type of business where, you know, you can always say this is reference, <laughs> you know, if you buy comic books or you buy movies or whatever, a lot of people use, you can use movies for reference for your comics for what you're drawing like if you need a specific locale you can buy a if you can remember what you know where a movie takes place you go oh you know mission impossible happened here here and then that becomes reference if you need reference on something um but yeah i buy i buy way too much stuff <laughs> you know <clears throat> but i don't have any other really bad vices i mean some people gamble and they do other things <laughs> I, I don't i don't gamble i just you know, I'm a nerd. <laughs> you spend money on on nerdy things. Yeah, it's good. healthy things, for example. Yeah. Also, uh, um, last last time we we spoke we spoke about your beginnings and how you work on All Star Squadron, right? And uh, Infinity Inc. <clears throat> Have you? been seen Stargirl? Oh, yeah, maybe? yeah. I've been watching that. And they, uh, I think Jeff Johns threw a little little name check Ordway thing in the, uh, I think it was the second episode of the second, second episode. Season. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, I, I feel like I didn't create Infinity Inc. or any of those characters by myself. So it would be nice to have, I would have been happy with having the Thomas, Ordway, and Macklin home for, uh, you know, wayward children or whatever it was called. <laughs> but it's nice to it's nice to have that. It's, it was nice to see some characters also uh, pop up. And that show is very much an Infinity Inc. show. Except yeah. It kind of, it's more Infinity Inc. after I left the book. After the first year, it was kind of more of that, the era that Todd McFarlane was drawing it. Um, but it's fun. I enjoy it a lot. <clears throat> Do you do you feel that uh, uh, we 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 someday we would see your take on Infinity Inc. on screen? I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I guess there's a point where we're at. I don't know if you guys experience any of the like here. We're gonna have like so many superhero movies in the next year, especially because they've been held back um, because of COVID. So it seems like there's going to be a superhero movie every, at least every month or two for the next yes. maybe couple of years. And you wonder at what point are these not going to make money? Because the minute they stop making money, I think that, you know, that will kind of affect whether any of the companies are willing to put up $200 million to make a, a big budget movie like that. Um, It'll be, movies go through phases where they go, <clears throat> you know, you have you had the James Bond phase, you know, and then you had Indiana Jones and things inspired by that, Star Wars. And like we're right now, we're still in that uh, kind of a comic book, you know, sweet spot <clears throat> where you see stuff that you would never have thought. Like I, I would never have in a million years have thought they would make a Black Adam movie, but it comes down to yes. having a star who wants to do it who's got a big enough name that he can do it. And, uh, you know, that one, that one will be interesting because it's, 
I mean, it'll be interesting to make a movie about a bad guy, although they're, you know, he's clearly not going to be a bad, bad guy, but he's, he's kind of more of a, a dark or a, a, a uh, anti-hero or something. Yeah. Yes. And, and also we expected so much that movie because it's the first time that all we're going to see the, the JSA in action. Right. Right. Because it, it's, it's, it's our, right. yes, Hawkman, Dr. Fate, and Adam uh, Smasher, who was Adam Smasher, right? I mean, it'll be interesting. I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to it because I think uh, something like that introducing the JSA is kind of a big deal. I would love to see them do a 1940s era, like a World War II era JSA. But the same is true for Marvel. It would be really fun for them to jump back and do Invaders. You know, yes, of course, yes, a submariner, the 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 tour, the human human tour, but I don't know if that would happen. I mean, it it would be fun if it did, because then you you still have you already have like an established Captain America if Chris Evans wanted to do it or not. I mean, um, but it, I I would love to explore those eras because I really like the I like looking back. And I mean, the recent Marvel movies like uh, Captain Marvel that Marvel did, setting it in the 90s was kind of fun. Um, you know, parts of Black Widow were set in the uh, in the past as well. And yes. uh, I mean, I think that's a good way to do it because it kind of almost expands your universe even more than just, oh, there's a lot of heroes, you know, and having guys guest starring. It's kind of cool to see who would be the first ones, you know, like, and maybe they can do that with the Fantastic Four. I don't know. I mean, it would be, it would be kind of fun to cool. have them pick a period and do that, you know, maybe what even honor the 60s. Which we, which would be your uh, fan cast for Fantastic Four? <laughs> I'm very, ter- I'm terrible at that. I, I you know, I, I really, it's like I did this, I went through this with uh, Shazam back in the 90s, like who would play Captain Marvel in, in a Shazam movie? I remember what you said. Because I was, I was thinking like there were different actors that could do it, you know. Um, but then, like I said, it's almost like you'd, you'd come up with it and it's, I mean, you do it for fun, obviously, but most times you're never going to, you're never going to be right, you know. Like when, when they cast, <clears throat> when they were first trying to, recast superman there were all kinds of rumors when you know i mean we can have fun with it but we also know that we're not the guys making the decision you know it's gonna get down to something totally different and they're always gonna pick somebody that you really probably didn't think would be the perfect guy but then they wind up being good you know you know our rumors now now the rumors are that uh probably liam neeson he will be cast as uh norman osborne And an eighth, huh. my Galactus. Galactus. Galactus too. Galactus too. Galactus too. It, it's uh, the, the huh. um, uh, Galactus. Uh, I think Norman Osborn, and there was one, one more, three huh. possible. Ca- and those characters. are all with Liam Neeson. Yeah, <laughs> yes. of course. I mean, it's, you, you, it's weird in a way because he's also he's at a certain age now where you think, well, I'm sorry, I'm going to adjust my camera a little bit more. Yes, sir. He's at no a problem. certain age where, I mean, he's still got a great voice and the way movies are advancing, they could probably, you know, do a younger version of him with the tools available to them now. So, I mean, the age itself doesn't seem as important as it used to, you know, as it used to be like if someone's got stature and they've got a, um, again, the good voice, I could yeah. easily see, you know, something like that. It'd be interesting. You know, I, I mean, well, do you think the Marvel movies are heading towards Galactus? Because it feels kind of like something big in this next wave. Because it's all space stuff. For it me, like- for me, for me, the 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 they're gonna do like uh, Loki. They're preparing a, a villain at, at the same level of Loki, and I think that that uh, villain will be Doctor Doom. Oh yeah, and I love to. I I love that Daniel Craig could do uh, uh, Doctor Doom. I love yeah. it. I, I don't know, yeah. but I love it. I love it. But remember this. Remember this. They got the the big uh, 
the big surprise that it's Fantastic Four. And one of the big, the biggest thing in Fantastic Four is the Silver Surfer and Galactus. Yeah. Right. So uh, for me, it would be, uh, it wouldn't be crazy to, to think in the, the final, the final right. uh, villain, uh, uh, be Galactus, because uh, it's, it's, it's all going towards a Fantastic Four. Yeah. Fantastic Four, uh, uh, it would be crazy not to use uh, that storyline. Right. But be... using, using it right, not like right. they use it in the second right. movie right. with a with a cloud, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big... I mean, it's funny because I like the first Fantastic Four back in whenever that was, two, early 2000s. 2005. It was fun, and it kind of got the right feel to it. It just, it wasn't, it didn't have the same uh, stature that it should have had. I mean, it really should be like the the movie. It should be like Endgame, really. Anything Fantastic Four related should be really big. Because otherwise, you know, what's the point? You know, so, mm -hmm. I mean, the idea of doing like Doctor Doom, introducing these different characters you could set up, and again, maybe that's what they're doing. You set up the, the threat, it becomes celestial, it, it gets bigger with each of the movies, and then maybe the Fantastic Four, maybe somebody discovers the negative zone and the Fantastic Four have been trapped since the 1960s. You know, I mean, something like that could be kind of fun. But then, you know, that's just that's just me thinking, you know, what, what I would like to see. But, you know, I'm sure... They're at that stage, whatever they do, I think will be good because they've had so many attempts at the Fantastic Four, but Marvel finally has it. So I think Marvel will put, you know, they pull out all, all stops and they'll do the whatever it takes to make that uh, successful, you know. Um, it could yeah. be good about the, the thing of, of the negative zone, about the Quantumania and the Ant Man movie. Right. The third. They yeah, said they... that something, something like that. Well, I mean, even the fact that, like in the Loki show, the fact that they kind of fractured the space-time continuum to a degree, it gives you a sense that anything could happen. And again, the Fantastic Four, if they, the way that you think they might cast, they, they would be characters that have already been around on whatever world they're on. You know, you're doing like a crisis, maybe where you're, comp you know, you're compressing multiple realities into one and hey here's the fantastic four we never met them before but on you know in this new world they've been around you know i mean there's plenty of ways to do it it just it's it's kind of exciting to think about that as a as as a just as a thing you know um but i would love to see them do i keep thinking about this with <clears throat> i don't know if you guys you've they've have run what if i mean do you have access to the yes Disney? yeah so what if the uh, animation style is very nice and you could tell they spent money on it. It's pretty much like rotoscoping with some, you know, digital type of process. But it, it would be neat to see them do something like they did in that. Um, in some of the episodes of what if they used Kirby dots in some of the energy stuff, there were actually like the little energy dots that Jack Kirby was kind of famous for. And that made me think it would be really cool if they could create something like that in the style of the comic artist, you know, and actually do like a Jack Kirby visual for an animated Fantastic Four or something like that. I mean, the, the, the potential's there. It's just, you know, you don't know. It's something that as a fan, I would like it, but maybe it's not a big enough deal for the world or for, you know what I mean, for that audience. Because I'm old and I remember that stuff better than, you know. <laughs> no, I, and again, it's just because I've been around, you know, it's not anybody's fault that they're 20 years old and they haven't seen that stuff or that they didn't grow up with it. Everybody has a, a different starting point that, that becomes kind of their touchstone, you know. <clears throat> but Jerry, uh, now more than never... <laughs> The, the 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 old things are in the mood 
they are the cool things and here for example i i got a slide for example <laughs> this right <laughs> this one batman this awesome job you did with uh, the batman the adaptation i what love it you you had the chance to do the cover from the number one i think and number two also no it was i was an alternate i don't know how it appeared there but my cover that's not my cover i did an alternate one with uh, two face in the background that was kind of set up um uh like here it was they do multiple covers on a comic so like yeah. when you go to the comic store that was the main cover but then they did one of mine and i don't know if they did an yet another but sometimes they'll do three or four covers on a, on a comic um so it becomes kind of a you know like it becomes tricky in a way i don't know how it's how they do that in you know other countries when they reprint it whether they're just including everything in the in the same book or if they actually are doing multiples but the yeah, idea of, of they, multiple they, or... they include everything here, yeah. here 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 i'm gonna show you all right let's see i got the argentinian version yes we i have the same <laughs> from perfect <laughs> from perfect this was one of the first here look at this yep. you recognize that drawing <laughs> oh yeah do you remember doing this yes i do <laughs> they, they did a, a little check why why they uh, they did the little change on in the ending uh showing uh, alex knox with the with the cape and the and the and the mask and everything yeah. like that that was in the that was in the original shooting script it was oh. a way to explain you know how bruce wayne gets away or how batman gets away when they got spotlights and they're trapped up on a on a bat bat rope or whatever it was a way to kind of direct people you know the police to a different you know whatever a different target um but that was you know i mean ultimately the movie didn't need that i think you know a lot of times when someone's writing a script they're trying to connect scenes and they're trying to explain stuff and when they start editing a movie they go well we've got already got a movie that's coming in around two hours long do we need that scene it would have been fun if if i thought they'd filmed it but maybe they hadn't um it would have been fun if they would have included some of those in some of the dvd releases it would have been you know um but i don't know how much extra stuff they filmed they they had storyboarded a bunch of stuff and i know that the 25th anniversary of the movie when they put it on blu-ray they did include storyboard sequences that weren't you know that never wound up in the film i mean i still feel it i always feel bad for uh <clears throat> the actress who was gonna play Vicky Vale. Um, Kim, Kim Basinger. Well, Kim Basinger stepped in, but it was originally um, Sean Young was going to Sean do Young, it. of course. Sean Young. Was, yeah. There was a whole big sequence that took place on a horse, like a horseback, you know, chase. So she was training for that scene because she'd never ridden a, ridden a horse or something. So she was doing training with this horse she fell off the horse and like broke her arm or her leg and she was oh. replaced which was kind of a shame because then they cut that scene from the movie you know so she winds up missing out on being in a batman movie which at the time she was at the peak of her career too and at the time yes. that would have given her you know another 10 years of a-list movies or whatever so she winds up getting injured training for a scene that winds up getting cut from a movie you know Yep, there's my cover. That's your cover. That's the cover. Yep. Uh, sir, I want to ask you this question about this this Batman, this Batman '89. Did, did you like the the hairstyle like Reed Richards they did to Bruce Wayne? Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> when you the the art, I think is really nice, and I think they basically tried to they tried to make the characters look 
like the actors, but not enough like the actors that it would cause any kind of legal issues. So I think by doing that, it was kind of natural to maybe enhance, you know, Michael Keaton's hairline in the, you know, I mean, in the second movie adaptation in um, Batman Returns, uh, Steve Irwin and Gar Jose Luis Garcia Lopez did the art mm -hmm. for that. And they did kind of a similar thing. They've kind of made him a little yes. bit closer to the comic version of the, you know. Um, I got it. But yeah, it's it's funny. I don't I don't you know, I, it's a tough it's a tough job to try to get capture likenesses. Um, but in some respects, it's even harder if you don't have likeness approval that you have to kind of create a Michael Keaton template, but it's not quite Michael Keaton or, you know, any of the actors like people kept saying <laughs> when they when when the uh, Batman cover that I did was posted online, people were like, yeah, Billy D. Williams is finally two face. And I kept <laughs> like re saying it, correcting him going, no, it's a Billy D. Williams like character not billy d williams because you know he, <laughs> yes. they didn't have i don't think they had likeness rights for for him uh for this other thing but i could be wrong i just uh a couple of years ago dc did batman 66 and they <clears throat> apparently had they had likeness rights for burt ward and adam west but the other actors who had passed away like the the actor who played alfred and and harriet and even Commissioner Gordon, they were long dead, so no one could sign away, you know what I mean, the rights. So in the comics, I remember they were they specifically were like, oh, we have to do something that implies the Batman 66 visual of Alfred and Anne Harriet, but it can't be a, a caricature. I mean, you can't do a likeness, um, which is kind of funny. And I actually yeah. drew, I, I had written a two-part story for the Batman 66 that... I just I did I was distracted by other work and I guess I, I I took long enough on it that the book wound up being canceled so it never I did I completed layouts for part one and part of part two and I scripted both parts but it never saw print and it would have been fun I I, I, I uh, still hate when you you know I put that much effort into something and it never uh, gets printed but it happens <laughs> and you watch the movies what was in that outlet? Sorry, Mario. What was uh, it about the script? This Batman sixty six. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, I was writing and drawing. It was done as a. I think it was a digital a digital download comic for DC, and then they would collect it or whatever. I don't think it was a print comic, but uh, I was supposed to do a two part uh, story with uh, Eartha Kit, Catwoman, which I chose because I was a big fan of that. Eartha Kit Catwoman. Um, and I, it was just, it was really fun to write it. It just, it happened. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the timing was just bad because I wound up <clears throat> having to wait on approvals for something. And then I wound up getting busy on another project. I was doing um, semi auto magic with uh, Alex DeCampi for Dark Horse. And uh, that had a, a more pressing deadline. So the other thing got pushed back and then eventually it didn't happen because DC had canceled the, the Batman 66 comic. Um, but it was a fun story. I mean, it, I, I grew up with that. I was the right age when that uh, Adam West Batman show came on TV because I would have been maybe nine, you know, nine years old. I thought, I just thought everything was realistic and I didn't get that it was campy. You know, I was the, the the kid age where I took everything seriously and I thought it was a serious show, um, but I loved it at, at that age. It was uh, it was it was very exciting and and that in a way led me to Marvel Comics because it made me try to find Batman comic books on the newsstand at the time. You know because I really liked Batman on TV, so um, it kind of paved the way for me to find Marvel comics and become you know a big fan of those. And you know, uh, sir, um, we sorry, we have uh, we grew up here, uh, Kyle and I and many many of us uh, grew up with that TV show of Batman, because they they are going to uh, to release the movie in the in '89. I am four years old, 
and I took it so serious like you <laughs> about that show. So I, I really, I really love it. That show, I, I still love it because it's it's great. And I want to ask you uh, if you could uh, watch the two TV two, uh, two movies, the animated movies about Batman '66. One uh, Cape Crusaders and the other with Two Face with William Shatner as uh, Two Face. I did see those. I saw both of them. Um, they were fun. It was it was very much it was a lot of fun that Adam West got to to do the voices. I mean, any of the actors that were still around got to do the voices. You know, I mean, I think that uh, kind of meant more for someone my age to appreciate it because I had that you know connection to it from from 1966. So. I mean, it's the same kind of connection with Star Trek, with Shatner and DeForest Kelly and, and Leonard Nimoy. And Leonard Nimoy. It becomes that that's your, your, I guess it's your version of the character because when you're a little kid, it kind of imprints on you, you know. It becomes probably uh, a little, you know, most most of your memories from those time frames have, have, like you said, you can remember, I can remember watching you know, making sure I was in front of the TV to watch Batman. And we had it in the two parts. I don't know if when they re, when they reran it, but it was on um, two, Wednesday and Thursday night. And they were half hours, which ended with a cliffhanger. And on Thursday night, you, you saw how Batman got out of the trap. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, yes. it was a, an added kind of fun aspect for me as a kid, because you didn't know he was going to get out of the trap. You know what I mean? You were like, of course. Too <laughs> of course. it was a huge kid hunger. <laughs> Even after it happened for a year, you still thought, well, maybe this time he won't get out. I have to watch it. <laughs> Will Batman and Robin still oh. alive in this trap from the Joker? <laughs> here, here we have we have uh, the the privilege that the show runs uh, run every day. So we didn't have to uh, to wait right. for a week. <laughs> for a week. <laughs> the next day, it was <laughs> the next day to see what happened to Batman and Robin. Yes, it it, it was amazing. The uh, it was the, the the Batman Club was the name uh, yeah. Maku Masuka. Uh, yeah. it, it, uh, the, the TV show here in '89 it was called the Batman Club. So. Uh, all the people uh, send uh, a lot of, of, of art about the characters they play, and right. they they win a it lot of prizes. Bad mania. It was a bad mania. Yes, it was a bad mania, of course, yeah. a bad, bad mania. And and also they they give uh, as a gift uh, some superpowers action figures. Oh, cool! Because it, they were not then the, the, they were not another uh, the other the other action figures from the movie. Right. So it it was it was a bad mania here in '89. It was a huge. Batman was huge. We have bicycles, uh, swimming. So we wear swimming swimming well, pools. But you know what's funny? Again, like you don't really. Ex everybody experiences these things in their own, you know, time and their own era. <clears throat> when the Batman show came on, it debuted, and I still remember it was like early January of 1966. And it went, so it was a half season as TV shows were, they ran in September to June, basically, for a full season. So Batman was half a mid-season replacement. And when it ran, they had the best, I guess, like a built-in uh, kind of amazing promotional aspect because the, the show ran. And then in the summer when the show ended, there was a Batman movie. And it was, uh, it was you know, like a... 90 minute movie with all the villains in it right and it had the right the bomb and the, with the uh, bomb and the nuns and it but it was it was like a you know as a kid it was just the most amazing thing because in a sense that the tv show was like a several months of build up and promotion for something that you actually had to go to a movie theater and pay for and i remember you know my brother uh my brother joel and i joel was like two years older than me going to the movie theater and there was a line that went around the block at this theater on a saturday of course but we stood in line we got in to see it and everything we thought it was the best thing ever you know but yeah. again it, it it depends on how it hits you at what age you're at because obviously the show was had a dual kind of target 
you could be really young and totally accept everything as serious, or you could be, say, a teenager and above and realize that it was campy and that they were kind of winking at the audience and, and making fun of it a little bit. Um, you, you know, sir, a few years ago in, in, in town I live, in the city, we um, um, a movie a movie theater from from the from the state from the city showed Batman and Robin <laughs> Batman 1966 and it was huge huge really huge because it was a lot of people came and the and the, it was for free so yeah. they 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 had to do another another release <laughs> to oh, another, well, another so day because it was popular it was <laughs> popular and, really and imagine this uh, Mr. Orway the chance to see that movie for people like us that didn't have the chance to see it on the big screen. Oh, yeah. That was, yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. That was amazing. That was mm -hmm. amazing. And that's all, like, I don't know about it we're worldwide, but in the U.S., the TV show had run on some cable channels for, like, in the 90s, but it wasn't available on home video because of the dispute between, like, It was ABC was the network and Fox was the studio. So there was like a dispute between the parties. So it, it never got released until they resolved that. But the movie was released, you know, um, on DVD early enough. Um, but it's just funny. So w once they finally did put the TV shows out, they had really good quality um, source material for the TV shows so that they had the little openings because I mean, a lot of stuff got chopped down when they ran it later on because those shows were too long and that the, they would cut scenes for commercials. So uh, the DVD or the Blu-ray release um, restored all the original, you know, all the original footage was in there and they used to do like little teasers at the beginning mm -hmm. and uh, all those kind of got lost in years of, of rerunning them on TV. So it was kind of fun to see it all, you know, back. Because again, you watch it and you go, oh, I forgot. Yeah, I remember that. You know what I mean? There's little bits that you don't, you, you forget, but that your brain is, oh, when you're a kid, didn't they used to do, you know? So I'm, I'm glad for archival type stuff. Um, it's you know, sir, uh, one in, in, the, in the particular, in the movie, in the Batman movie, Uh, they show us, remember that they show us a, a lot of people, a lot of cities around the world. Right. About the, well, one of the footage, some footage from the, from the people was filmed in Argentina. Oh, cool. Because, because one of the, the because uh, when it was a, a big funeral here in 1952 uh, about uh, Evita, you know, Evita was? Yes, yes. Was, well, they uh, they filmed the, the the Peron's government hired a, a cinematographer from 20th Century Fox. Oh, interesting. so they filmed they filmed uh, all the funerals so to show the people and many parts of the of uh, Buenos Aires, and they included in the movie. Oh, that's funny. So wow. so 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 many parts I of the movie were that. included. Well, yes, it was it, it was it had the, the story involved the United Nations, right? And they were taking yeah. different uh, representatives of different countries and turning them into powder or something, right? They <laughs> kind of like dehydrated them into Bro, powder. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that idea was awesome. That's what, when yeah. when you think about it, when they 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 transform. The, the leader of the United Nations into powder in the uh, in the pro, I think. In the pro, yeah. Imagine that what was... they would do with that now, though. I mean, now, you know, you like, remember that there was a scene where they were mixing up the tubes or something? And yeah. You know, <laughs> now with digital effects, yeah. imagine what they could do. They could create some kind of horrible composite person. <laughs> well, I was going to ask, I was going to ask you uh, something uh, about that. That the campy thing, the campy thing, versus the dark, obscure, and right. weird stuff that Burton brought to the movies. Yeah. What was your uh, when? Because uh, you first uh, uh, draw the the movie adaptation before the movie. Right. 
what what was your uh, experience when you you saw all that source material that you you were uh, about to draw? I was I was very excited because I thought it looked really cool. I mean the in to me the the Batman eighty nine costume is my favorite of all the Batman costumes. It's not practical, but it was my favorite because it looked the the headpiece was molded rubber. He had like thick neck muscles molded in. He couldn't move his head, but it looked good. You know, I mean, it looked like the comic book version. Um, and the, the I, I just thought the all the production design was really good. The uh, the uh, um, I had got I'd seen like the sketches that were done by Anton first of the city and the, the, it just had a, it, it was just a really beautiful, a beautifully designed movie. You know, all aspects of it were just, the interior design was really good, but the sets were really good. The props were good. I mean, they really didn't, you know, they, they, they spent money in every department. It was, and it was one of the memories I take away from that is uh, having, being lucky enough I was at a convention in London in October of 1988 as they were building the sets. They were they were pretty much complete because I think they were ready to start filming at the end of October or something. So they were the exterior sets were pretty much done. The interior stuff was still being built. And I got to do a, a little informal tour and the when we were sitting in the publicist, the uh, it was at Pinewood Studios, just outside of London. The publicist was talking to us, and he said that because this was this this is the place where they made the you know they did Star Wars, they did all the James Bond movies were done at Pinewood, yes. oh. and uh, he was bemoaning the fact because they didn't know Batman was going to be a huge success. They were actually this guy who had worked there for like twenty years at that point was saying. It's kind of sad to think that these big studio pictures would not be made at Pinewood anymore, because there was it was kind of like a, a slow period with, you know, with British production maybe, and and uh, so it was just it was intriguing that that was his takeaway was that this was almost the the end of an era for for big budget, you know, extreme. Because I mean, they built they built like the city. You know, there was yeah, maybe yeah. eight blocks of of city built on the exterior set at Pinewood. It was a huge production. Obviously, the movie did really well, and that really bodes well for any type of thing. Because then other studios are going to want to, you know, do the same thing. So, uh, um, you know, they were worried it was going to be the end of an era, and instead, it kind of became the beginning of an era, um, because you know, Pinewood, they wound up doing, you know, there's probably still, well, now they're even, Pinewood has a studio in Atlanta. So, I mean, they've expanded beyond uh, London, but they're, they're doing all the Marvel movies. A lot of the Marvel stuff is is filmed oh, cool. in uh, uh, exteriors in, the, in at Pinewood, Atlanta. Um, so it's just interesting, though, how that type of production was kind of, I think, Maybe again, Superman had failed. Superman four was a kind of a bomb, you know. Uh, the James Bond movies were a little shaky at that point. You know, we're talking eighty nine. Uh, they were rebooting with the Timothy Dalton, That's but I think on. you know a lot of people were worried because you can't you can't keep a studio like any of those big facilities. They hire, they employ a lot of personnel there's a lot of people who build the sets and the props and the costumes interiors carpenters all these people that's an infrastructure that you need you know if these films take three months you need to do four of them a year and you know they're all big budget films so i mean it it, it was it was interesting because at that time it felt like that might have been a you know something that was going out and and instead we've you know, they turned a corner and, and it's done nothing but, you know, uh, improve as far as those facilities that they're expanding everywhere. You know, I mean, the new James Bond movie, clearly these they're filming a lot of location stuff, but they're still going to film somewhere in England for, you know, sound stages. I think I, I think the, the 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 last part of the movie 
when included in the island, I think this this is that was Pinewood Studios, the yeah. the facility of the villain of Seven. Yeah. I, I think it, it yet, so it, don't spoil it. <laughs> don't no, spoil no, 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 no. Don't be a spoiler, Ryan. <laughs> no, no. I'm a big, I'm a big, I'm a huge fan of James Bond. Yeah. So uh, I, I recognize the, the the kind of things of the studio because the studio is the same. Is is the Bond right. stage, the yeah. 007 stage. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, they filmed a lot of things there. Uh, I think well, they built Fort Knox. Remember Fort Knox in Goldfinger. Right. Well, you're, I mean, if you're a fan of Bond from the early days, it's always funny because if you watch, I've been re-watching some of the very first ones and uh, I just watched on Her Majesty's Secret Service on a Blu-ray, really beautiful. I, it's one of my favorites of the Bond movies and and they use the same kind of road in almost every yes. one of them. They'll do that windy, there's that windy road there's and it's probably somewhere in italy maybe i don't know but it's yes it's, in, Mat in matera it was in matera it's definitely like you see it in almost every one of the movies because it's perfect for a, a car chase you know it's got all the <laughs> twists and turns and elevations where you can look down and there's the car coming up and um it's just kind of funny if you see enough of these things that you can kind of spot that you know like you're saying with you know you spot a location because a lot yes. of times it's something set somewhere. It doesn't mean it was filmed there. And it's it's always interesting to me how you can, even here, like you, they can film, um, they're, they're filming, you know, like something that's supposed to be Boston. They can film it in, you know, Brooklyn or, or, or you know, somewhere the Bronx of New York. It's just a matter of finding a couple of blocks that look, you know, uh, close enough that they can just a little add some dressing to them and add change the signs and convince you you know but uh building a gotham city is is different and that was you know in the second batman movie that was one of the problems i think they had was that they filmed it in an interior it was it, the largest sound stage that warner brothers had but it's still interior and it's hard to get any air you know in a film like that because you know that you don't you can't do you know, a big long chase scene because you're gonna just be going in a circle. Um, uh, but, uh, anyways, I guess those are tangents. We've gone off on a on a movie tangent. <laughs> here, here, I have some part of the artwork. Oh, I lost. Sorry. Here, they're sending you regards, Jerry. Here, a lot of people showing you love. They said, Geek Boy said, I love Jerry's work and Power of Shazam. <laughs> Here, Juan Pedro from Chile. I love you, Je Thank I you. love Jerry's work. Juan Pedro. Hi, from Chile. Yeah. No. Greetings from Argentina. Uh, he, uh, what I was about to show you was some originals that i found mm. look at that look at that mario that's yeah it. that's a picture of the original art from the the last page of the of the comic. my first my first comic book was my first comic book of my life the this um this cover the second the the, the cover in the center Mm -hmm. We we never we never saw the cover. No, this this yeah, wasn't the first time we saw the this cover. Oh yes. really? Yeah, they did here in the United States. They did the uh, the movie book was in two different editions. The the one that had the painted cover was, I think it was five five dollars or something, and it was hard not hard bound but it was it was square bound with a cardboard you know like a, a yes. thicker cover yeah. and the other one was meant for newsstands which would have been you know is more of a later oh, more comic book you know uh weight cover and that was sent to like drug stores anybody who sold comic books that would be returnable because it was a weird system back then the there was a direct for spinner comic racks for, for, yeah. for spinner racks yeah so the spinner racks those comics were almost given to the stores on consignment and they 
whatever weren't, wasn't sold would be returned and then the store would only pay for what they sold, which wasn't really profitable for the, you know, the comic companies after a while. That was a little too, uh, a little too scary, I guess, because they would have to print a lot of comics in hopes of selling even half of the print run. Whereas, you know, for the direct sale, uh, you know, the comic book stores that we have, the, the, the chains or network of stores, the orders are fixed. So if you ordered 200 copies of a comic and you didn't sell all 200, that was on you, you know, uh, as opposed to the newsstands where they could get credit for what the ones they didn't sell. Mm -hmm. Jerry, did you uh, keep any originals from the movie adaptations? Yeah, the, the scans and the pictures that you showed, I have the whole book except for two pages. I gave one page to my editor, Jonathan Peterson, who I drew in the, the scene where the Joker's throwing money away. And Jonathan was the guy in the hat going, holding the, the Joker. The Joker. The Joker. Oh, the, the, the Joker <laughs> bill. Yeah. And then, oh. the, then the, other, the other page that I gave away was the page where the Joker was on TV and he was torturing a guy by giving him a spoonful of, and that was my editor, Mike Carlin. Uh, I gave Mike that page. It was just a little fun in joke. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. I, I love that page. I don't know if they reprinted it in your area, but DC did a hardcover reprint in, I want to say, 2019. So it would have been the anniversary. And the mm -hmm. book was the regular comic, and then each page facing each other one page was the original art a scan of just the art that i made from the art and then the comic page on the other side so it was like a a double book or whatever but it was all scans from oh. the originals in black and white no and, here, uh, no no I, i remember i remember a scene on a amazon in, in the u.s yeah. Yeah, but yeah. here uh, it didn't. The only the only oh. thing we have is that comic book from from yeah. the oh, really? eighty nine. Reprinted it there. No, no. The, the, only, the only the only print uh, we okay. we got access to was this one from Perfume, right. and the one from uh, Editorial Cinco that was Cinco. the Spanish one. Okay, yeah, yeah. I wonder if I have a. I wonder if I have a copy on the bookshelf that I could even grab. No, I don't. But it was like, it was a little bit taller than the, the original edition. It was maybe nine by 10 or 12 by nine or something. It wasn't original art size, but it was kind of nice that they, you know, they included the, uh, the scans. And I just basically pulled an envelope with all the art that I still have. And uh, I could do that for them. I mean, I, I've got almost all my Superman art. Um, at one point, I was buying pages from Dennis Janke when he was inking it because I said, if you're going to sell these pages, I'll buy them for whatever you were going to sell them for. I'll buy them back. So I have complete issues of a lot of that stuff. And uh, I've offered to scan stuff for DC, but I don't think they care. You know, I mean, it's unfortunate because I do think there would be I think it would be a market for it to a degree, just even for them when they reprint stuff, they're often using really bad reproduction, you know, old photostats or, or whatever. And I mean, I think it means more to me as an artist maybe than it does to them as a publisher. You know, it's not good. You know, Jerry, I, 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 would, I would kill for an artisan edition of Superman yeah, with the original think... artwork. I mean, again, it's a, it's a, it's, I don't, I can't publish it myself, obviously. I've reached out and said, hey, it would be nice to do something. But, um, and even with the Batman thing, I, I had gone on Twitter when I heard they were going to reprint the book. I went on Twitter in, it was probably January of 2019, because I had just seen DC was going to reprint it. I said, hey, why don't you do an artist edition for the 30th anniversary? And, I, it got tons of retweets. I mean, it really was like one of the most popular tweets I'd made. Yeah. And a lot of fans were like, yeah, do it, do it. And then it's like, well, 
the company that it was doing the artist editions didn't have the rights to do DC ones anymore. But by, I guess, the outreach and having a, as many fans, you know, support it, DC decided to combine the artist, the, you know, the original uh, scans with the comic reprint. So it gave them, instead of a book being 64 pages, it gave them, a, you know, 120 eight page book that they could then put out as a hardcover, I guess. Yeah, full um, experience for, for yeah. all of us. But they let it, I mean, the, the sad thing is it was, it, 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 they published it in November, I think it was November of 2019, and it was out of print in a, in a year's time. I don't understand why they wouldn't have done a second printing because people, every time I get, you know, people coming on Twitter saying, hey, did, did they ever do that book? And it's like, yeah, but it's not available. Um, and and the, the sad part about that is that's where they could help me as an artist. I mean, I'm not getting regular work from DC or whatever, but if they keep reprinting stuff, if they kept it in print, it would likely sell enough copies that I would get some kind of royalty off of it. You know, I would get something back, but if they don't keep it in print, they've limited what they're going to give me for it, you know, because it's going to be just whatever the initial orders were, and that's it, you know? And, and, and a lot of these things do seem to have, uh, you know, like longer sell times or whatever, because people do discover it even now, thinking about the Bat Batman, the Keaton Batman being in the, uh, in the movie, the in the Flash movie, okay. or even in conjunction with the Batman 89, the new comic, they should have that other one still in print Right. I mean, if they're doing something that's playing off of that in the new comic, why wouldn't they have the one I did with Denny O'Neill in 1989? Why wouldn't they have that in print? It makes no sense to me from a marketing point yes, of view. Yes, of course. But, you know. I think, and, I, and also I, in the 92. I, and also in the 92. I yeah. think it may, maybe in next year uh, uh, DC will uh, reprint it because yeah. of the movie. Because of yeah. the movie. They will. Uh, I don't know, but you know, I mean, they didn't like when uh, when Shazam came out. They had none of my Shazam available, and I do think that. You know, I'm not saying that I didn't create Shazam, but I think my DNA is in the movie. You know, the stuff that I did in the in the '90s is is pretty much of course what the movie was about. So, I mean, it's weird to me. Totally. It, felt, it feels like that's when you would do it if you were, you know, trying to, to either play off of something that's going to get a big, you know, multi-million dollar media uh, push. You know, it, it, it doesn't make sense. But again, I, a lot of stuff is not making sense to me. I mean, it feels like all DC, DC is doing now is just Batman material. You know what I mean? For mm -hmm. As far as comic stuff. Um I would hope that I don't know when the sec when the next or Shaz the second Shazam movie comes out, <clears throat> but I think the second volume of the Power of Shazam collection is supposed to come out in December of this year. Yeah, uh, but but that's that's been up in the air. Some people say it is. Then Amazon had it, and then Amazon dropped it. So I don't know what's happening with it, but I would hope that it's available when the movie when the second movie happens. Um, Cause again, you know, that's, that's where I can make money. You know what I mean? I'm not yeah, making sure. money from them hiring me to do stuff of at the course. very least. If you're going to, if you're going to play with people's childhoods and put movies out with this stuff, you know, throw up, throw some crumbs at the people who uh, maybe inspired the movie stuff, you know? Um, uh, Jerry, I, I I love the 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 homage you you did in in the in the second uh, here in the second drawing with Wiz in the tower. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's it's lovely. <laughs> it's that's lovely. actually that's a recreation, which is kind of funny. I did that for a fan uh, for the Hero Initiative back in I think 2013, and. Uh, um, I colored it for him because he really wanted it colored. But the actual, po it was a poster. DC did it, we did it as a poster in 94, I believe, the year before the, the hardcover came out. Um, we did actually two posters, retail posters for, through, through the comic stores. 
and that image was one. Um, I don't think I have it up here. I can't point the camera to it. Um, but yeah, it's that the, that was originally uh, uh, the ultimately that was the first of the new Shazam that I was doing. That was the first uh, time you really saw him. So uh, it, it was good. It was kind of helpful to be able to, you know, kind of like cheat and establish Wiz Radio before we needed <laughs> before I needed to draw it. Because um, again, there was, the case with Shazam is that I re. I didn't revamp it. I retold the origin, but the the main thing there was I tried to make the city distinctive and like a movie where you're going to have a production person and designer. It's all me. So I tried to study up on Art Deco because I wanted something that felt timeless, but also special in a way. And uh, Art Deco was such a big part of the early, you know, especially 1930s and in, in uh, New York and, and different places that it felt like that would evoke an age and a, it would make that, you know, Fawcett city seem very distinctive. Um, so it was, it was a lot of effort on my part to try to do that, you know, establish that in the graphic novel. Uh, but uh, you just don't, again, when you're a comic person, you don't have somebody else do designs for you or, costumes or anything like that you just do it yourself so you have to have, mm. you have to that's why i say with movies i watch movies you have to be kind of open to all these different you know sources and different types of arts you know you have to study a little bit of architecture and you have to study a little bit of costume design and um and vehicle design and things like that um Jerry. Would you like to would you like to see Shazam movie or something back in the forties? It would have been fun to do that. I do think it, 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 it. I'm still waiting for them to do one of these movies like that. I mean, again, it would be really terrific if they did actually did a Shazam um, uh, JSA movie and they set it in 1940 41. Um, I kind of like the idea of it. You know, I think as far as making something different, something that doesn't necessarily look like everything else. I always liked the period anyways. And I liked the, like the Brendan Fraser mummy movies were fun because they were set in that kind of golden era. Um, I, I like the era. So I would <clears throat> rocketeer is another one that I love. Oh, yes. Oh, okay, dear. And, uh, I love it. it. Just it's, it, it would set it, it would set it apart. I think, you know, it would make, It help it be its own thing so um but yeah to me it uh, you know those characters like at least like the first captain america movie the stuff that was you know was all set in world war ii or early you know world war ii era it was all fun and it had it, it also pays a little bit of uh tribute to when the comics were created and i think that's kind of a extra added bonus which would be really cool with the jsa would be to pay a little bit of uh, tribute to the origins of when those those characters first popped up, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Here in the in, in the image, uh, returning to Shazam, uh, I I I find find some some este, some sketch you did from a, for for a cover, and yep. here, here it says fax to Mike Carling. DC editorial. <laughs> That's, that sets it in an era too. <laughs> that was what we had before we before we could send something, uh, you know, a JPEG or or something on uh, digitally on, on a computer. We had fax machines. How did the fax you, machine how, how, was a very important part of my my job when I was on <laughs> Superman too, because we, you know, we would. Uh, Uh, how was the process, Jerry? How was the process? You when you, well, you received the, the full when script? I was, when I was writing when I was writing for Tom Grummet, for example, it was a different process than when I was doing it for myself. Um, but when I was doing even whenever I was writing and drawing with on Superman, I still had to type up a plot. The plot had to be you know, like an outline had to be submitted to the editor who approved it, and then I would start doing layouts and I would do a rough layout pencil layouts on the actual comic 
artwork pages, you know, the 10 by 15 size uh, art. I would lay out the pages. I would rule in all the panel borders. I would show where the balloons would go. I would type up the script and then those pages with the rough layouts and the script would go to the letterer. Um, more often than not was John Costanza, who was just a really terrific letterer and a really nice guy. But John Costanza would then letter, hand letter the pages. And while he was doing that, I would send the first half of the book. So it's a 22 page comic. He would get 11 pages in the first batch while he was lettering the first 11 I would lay out and script, you know, dialogue, the page 12 through 22. And then I would ship those to him by FedEx, <clears throat> you know, by, so FedEx would, would then come back to me. By the time I was finished with that, I would get my pages with lettering on them and I could tighten up the pencils. And then Dennis Janke, who was inking, lived in a, about, a, I think, a town or so over from me. So I would call up Dennis and I'd say, Dennis, I got four or five pages. And then he would come to my house and pick up the pages and go ink them. So it was a really, it was like an assembly line, but it was very friendly. You know, it wasn't just like a, a mindless assembly line. We were all connected in some ways, you know. Uh, oh. But with, with, with the fax machine, the fax machine was how I would send them. A, a, I'd <clears throat> print out a copy of, my script or my, you know, plot or whatever, and I would fax it to DC. And then Mike Carlin would fax me copies of Dan Jurgens and Louise Simonson and Roger Stern, all the other writers' stories. And I used to have to file everything so that I knew what everybody was doing in at what issue and what, because the books came out like almost once a week. For a long time, it was three books. And then it became four books. So it was clearly one a week. And we'd keep track of all the plots, the subplots mostly. Jimmy Olsen goes into a bar, you know, mm. in the next issue that Jurgens is draw writing and drawing. Maybe Jimmy Olsen gets into a fight and Roger Stern picks up on that. So those elements would feel continuous, whereas the, the main stories were all their own thing. We were all doing like the main Superman adventures were different in the four books. And the subplots kind of carried it and gave it a family, you know, like a reason for you to buy all four. <clears throat> but yeah, the fax machine was very important. And uh, I used to buy these big, big rolls of fax paper that you'd have to load in because <laughs> most of the artists would turn in their work, like the pencil drawings would all go into the office. They would mail them in from all over wherever anybody was living. Tom Grummet was in Canada. He would ship his pages to Mike Carlin and they always arrived on Friday. And I think Friday hmm. was just like the day, right? So Carlin would get these pages on Friday. He would Xerox, reduce copies, Xerox everything, fax me these pages that Tom had drawn. And then I would have to sit down at the typewriter at my computer and I would have to do the dialogue for all those pages. And then you know, mark where the balloons were going and number the balloons to the script so that they could then be sent to the letterer. And it was instant. You had to do it. I got them midday Friday. I had to send them off, you know, to, to back to Mike Carlin by like say six o'clock at night. He would wrap that, you know, script up and, and the pages and send them to the letterer. So it was, it was really, you really had to keep on your toes and you had to keep track of where everybody else was at on their books. It was quite, I mean, it was, it was fun. It was a lot more work than just doing one comic by yourself because you really did have to read everybody else's work as they were doing it, you know, just so you didn't screw up something. If somebody designed a new daily planet building or something like that, you had to know, Oh, that starts in this issue. It was a lot of, uh, it was a lot of filing. So <clears throat> on Saturday morning, I would get a FedEx. Every one of us would get FedExes. Mike Carlin would Xerox everything in multiple copies of, you know, <laughs> whole sets. And each, each of the creative teams, the writer, the, the artists, would all get a FedEx package with everything that was turned in that week. So you would sit down and you, I, I had like my file folders. I had a folder for Adventures of Superman, one for Action Comics. One for Man of Steel, one for, you know, the main Superman book. And they got filed and sorted. And 
you know, that's how we kept track of what it, all, everybody else was doing. Jerry, um, you, know, I, you know, Jerry, sorry, Mario, you know, Jerry, in one book I bought, uh, I, I thought, I think it, it was Panic in the Sky, uh, the Superman storyline with Brainiac, and they print it uh, as a backup, as a extra material, like a, um, like a chart. Yep. You you use you guys use yes uh, with all these plots you you mentioned <laughs> with <laughs> like like here it says <laughs> uh, Jimmy Olsen turns the bar sounds like a joke <laughs> starting line, <laughs> but it was like that. It was like that. Jimmy Olsen is it's uh, in the street. Uh, Vivo <laughs> takes to the bar and that that goes again. That that was on a on a chart. That was yep. a a map that uh, you, you all use. A chart that yep. you all use, or it was a, a chart on a, on a board yes. in, in this at DC. When we did our when we did our story conferences, those charts were like. I guess 16 by 20 on a 16 by 20 pad, Mike Carlin would put them up on the wall and he would make a grid for, you know, the whole month, whatever month it was, October, here's the grid, all the, and then you'd, you'd have each of the books coming out in that month of October so that you could keep track of the order of the books coming out. First week was this adventure, second week action, third week, you know, Man of Steel, fourth week Superman. And then it would go back. So the idea with the charts was really to put the big, like just the big idea up. It didn't have to be worked out at that point. It was just, you know, uh, Superman fights the prankster or whatever it was. And then maybe a couple of lines about whatever subplot was going on with the other characters and whether that would continue across or not. So those were like the big strokes. And then Mike, at the, after the meetings were done, he would recopy everything small. <clears throat> you know, he would, I don't think he was using the same thing. I think he would recopy it a little bit neater, you know, and we would get those charts. And that was our kind of an overall kind of outline for where we were headed. And like Panic in the Sky, the storyline starts earlier and then it builds to where all the books cross over with each other. Um, and that was, you know, that we did that all the way up through uh, the death of Superman. You know, it was the same process just to make sure that it made sense and that nobody did something out of, you know, out of order or whatever. <clears throat> it was a lot. I mean, it was an unusual way to work, but it was very much like if you were somebody who played on team sports something like that i think you would get a sense of you knew what how to do that if you weren't if you weren't like a team kind of player it was harder for you and uh um i think when when uh, george perez was on the superman books for a bit george admitted that it was hard for him to work that way because ultimately you know you can't be you can't everybody's kind of treated treated equally in a way so you can't push a story through if everybody doesn't kind of go along with it. But it's also hard because sometimes you do the beginning of a story or you do the middle of a story or you do the end of the story without doing the other parts. And that's there's like a special um, there's a challenge to do that. You know, uh, you again, it, that's why I think of the team thing, you know, because a, a, like a basketball team or a baseball team or football team or whatever you have to work together with an ultimate goal of winning something. Well, with us, it was, we had to work together with the ultimate goal of creating like a, uh, an exciting storyline that the readers would like, you know? Um, and I think I was suited to it. I like being in the, you know, certainly the position I was in, I was uh, kind of the point man in a way, because I had been there from the relaunch from the burn you know, the start when Byrne had relaunched stuff. So I knew all the pieces. I knew a lot, a lot of the motivations that I had for the characters. Um, uh, but everybody performed their own function, which was int interesting, you know, as a, as a group dynamic. You know, Roger Stern was almost like the science guy. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> if you ran something by him, he would either he would be he would be really good with remembering some continuity aspect or he would set you straight on some science aspect or magic aspect. He was really good with the, you know, with the uh, uh, that as that part of it. Um, I think Dan and, and uh, you know, Wheezy also had different strengths. And uh, ultimately, you, you wind up being four parts or eight parts, you know, including the artist team or whatever is you're 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 all leading towards one goal which i think is uh why the stories are maybe still remembered well you know because we all i think we all had the common goal of we want superman to have a good audience we want the audience to be happy and to buy superman comics so that was our goal we were you know we didn't sell that well <clears throat> we weren't like we were at the bottom of the charts as far as sales but we wanted Superman, you know, to, to have a better audience than it did. So that was, I think that was the impetus to try to do even those crossover stories to make sure everybody's book sold the same because almost every store would carry Superman, but not every store carried Man of Steel or Action Comics or Adventures of Superman. So by doing that kind of tied in storyline, it brought all the books up a little bit, you know, sales wise they were all pretty much even <clears throat> and jerry what about uh, working on um, we talk about the last time we, we talk about but um well it was easy or, or was challenging doing all this all this line of work in death of superman a uh, funeral and and all the all the stuff right it was you know what it was it was challenging but it wasn't overwhelming You know, I mean, it was, um, I think that the key is it probably got harder for the guys, the people who I left after Adventures 500, where he comes back. And I think it got harder for them in that next year because the book was selling like tremendously well. I mean, it was the goal that we all had was to make Superman popular again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But while we were even doing the, the death of Superman, sales were starting to rise a little bit but they hadn't gotten to the crazy part where you know anybody could go wow this you know i think it's how do i put it we were still we, we shared the common goal but the success of it had not changed us at that point because we really hadn't gotten it then you know and i think it in any i don't care whether you're a comic artist or anything like it would be somebody If somebody won the lottery, you know, or somebody inherited money or whatever, it changes your priorities because we all pay bills and we all pay rent and, mm. and, and those aspects of life, you know. Um, so I think we did the death of Superman before any money came into our pockets. We, we knew as we we're plotting it that the sales, you know, the, it was getting a lot of buzz, but when we were actually working on it, the numbers, the sales numbers were not in at that point. because we always work like three to four months in advance of the books and they were solicited three months in advance. So if we started four months before the book would actually be printed, three months out is where the, the books are solicited by the publisher. And then hmm. maybe, Two months out is when they start getting the sales figures for the direct, you know, the uh, how many or how many comics are being ordered. So even when that book came out, it was under ordered for the amount of demand there was. So so when we got the, the numbers for for the death of Superman issues, they were good, but they weren't like a million. You know, it wasn't like at that point it was. It was like, oh, here's how many we, you know, the direct market bought a hundred thousand of them or something, and then, you know, they printed another hundred thousand for the newsstand market, and when people couldn't get them in the comic store, they would buy them off the newsstand, or comic dealers would buy them off the newsstand and sell them in their stores. So that's why that Death of Superman wound up selling a lot because they did something like five or six printings. They kept going back to press just to to keep up with the demand. Um, so again, I guess the, sh the short answer is none of us were really affected at that stage 
we were more affected after the death of Superman came out when we were planning the return of Superman. Then we knew that we had this, okay, we had a, a huge phenomenal, you know, interest in this thing. So we actually went back and had another quick meeting to discuss the return because we wanted to make sure it was satisfying, you know, and that everybody was, you know, like going to do the, you, you could, you knew you couldn't do like, if you look at the charts, the charts that we did, uh, that pre, you know, pre the sale, pre-existed the sales of, of death of Superman, the chart shows, you know, Clark Kent three, two months later being dug out of a building and he's alive and, and there's all this other stuff. So the, the story itself would have been fine the way we did it, but we needed to amp it up when we realized we had this huge audience for it. Uh, so the story became much more complex as a result <laughs> of the fact that we had this huge, huge audience that was anxiously awaiting what the next step was going to be, um, which was exciting. You know, I mean, again, I'd been on the book from at that point, that was 1993. I guess 92. Yeah, it would have been 92. Uh, I was on the book from about 86. I started drawing uh, on the book. So it was nice to suddenly have an audience, you know. Hmm. Um, and you present a lot of characters that nowadays we love it. Uh, you know, uh, the new uh, the new Superboy, Cyber Superman, yeah. Eradicator, Steel. Yeah. Well, well, Steel is one of my yeah. favorites. Oh, yeah. the, you know, the funny thing, too, is what, what again, the, the success of the death of part of it made those other things kind of happen, you know, the because at, at a certain point it was like, well, what are we going to pitch for what's next? How does Superman come back? And, you know, that's where everybody had different ideas. And it's like, well, why don't we do them all and make it into kind of a mystery? Is any of them actually Superman? So, so that was almost like a, a democratic kind of answer because everybody, you know, everybody wanted their chance and everybody made their pitch and uh, it gave them an, a whole different storyline, which and as a reader, I was, I was involved with it pretty much very minimally. Um, but as a reader, I read it and I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a really great extended, that whole return of Superman story was great, you know. Um, and I was very proud of all the people who were on the books that they were able to step up to the plate with a really good story, you know, having four Superman and having the, <clears throat> all the little twists and turns that happened in there still, uh, it still holds up to me, you know, as a, as a story, but, uh, but yeah, we, I, I mean, we had fun with it and we did the, the funeral for a friend. A lot of that stuff, uh, kind of came as a. That was all the stuff that we originally were more interested in than just the big fight where he dies. You know, it was like, what's the world like without Superman? Uh, and, and there were so many different things in, in our, you know, just our experience of having worked on the character and not being able to sell a lot of copies in the comic stores because it just wasn't a cool character. You know, everybody <laughs> always liked Batman, but Superman was was corny or whatever. So we played with the audience in a way by taking Superman away to make them appreciate who he was, you know. So ultimately, that all winds up in the in those comics. It, it winds up in, you know, the funeral for a friend and world without Superman uh, is almost, you know, again, a, a parable of what the comic fans uh, felt when Superman was taken away. It's like we didn't really like him, but now we like him, you know. <laughs> or we didn't appreciate him, but now he's gone and we appreciate him, you know? Um, you know, Jerry, uh, you mentioned that uh, there were many printings of uh, Dead of Superman. And here in Argentina, uh, this month is already printing. The, I think it's the second printing. They released They released The release really really no, of Dead of Superman, a book with all the issues from uh, all the, 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 dooms the doomsday storyline till right. he said. And uh, also, I, I would like to ask you if, if it, when you guys created this character, Cyborg, Superboy, Eradicator, and 
uh, still, if do you think that they would be everlasting that they they are because they uh, we could we could uh, have uh, two we have two yeah. still <laughs> live action characters one was Shaq and the other one in the <laughs> live action show Superman Lois. from Superman and Lois yeah so <clears throat> well I mean I, again I think because that that whole storyline was as popular as it was that you know any kind of I mean it was it really was like a kind of weird cultural phenomenon I mean it's hard to you know wrap my brain around the fact that that's so but it, it really was I mean it was kind of a it wasn't as big as the Beatles but it was kind of like you know something that everybody knew was out there you know and I think that helps in giving those characters some kind of longevity because even 20 years or 30 years later, you know, someone who read it when they were 10 years old is now working on the TV show or, you know what I mean? It, it, that's kind of how all nostalgia works is that it, it just like Batman 66 imprinted on my brain when I was, you know, nine years old. Uh, that's how that, that stuff happens is, is that it makes some great impact. And then people remember it, whether in, in, in if they remembered it poorly, obviously it wouldn't have the it wouldn't they wouldn't be around. You know, there's plenty of things that uh, were kind of flash in the pan or, or, or big at the time that, you know, maybe people don't have the fond feelings for. I don't mean just in comics, but just as a pop culture kind of thing or whatever. I mean, <clears throat> I always love the, the you know, I'd have to look in a dictionary, but it, I see the word uh, is zeitgeist, and basically it's like what's in the air at a certain time. You know, uh, those are the type of things that I think impact. Just like, you know, maybe I don't know how old you guys are, but I, how old are you? I'm 35. 40. Okay. So, I mean, like in that your age, there's probably – you had you did you guys have or were you were you into like GI Joe or Transformers, uh, He Man, He Man toys? So I mean, like that. Those are all like little touchstones for me as a kid. It was, you know, the Marvel superheroes cartoon show, Batman sixty six, Captain Action was a toy figure. It was like a twelve inch doll. I must have one here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean something like this, right? There's that's oh, the Captain Action, yeah. but he's in a commando, like a police SWAT costume. But <laughs> looks that was like, like a big Sly. Thing. Looks like Sly. What's that? Looks like Sly Stallone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does have that. Yeah. I always <laughs> felt at, this is the same sculpt from the '60s. I always felt like they were trying to do a little bit of a James Bond thing with him, you know, like a uh. Sean Connery, but. Um, yeah, and I mean, everybody's got that, you know, those things that they liked when they were a kid. And, uh, you know, that stuff does tend to have a second and third and fourth life, depending on whether it's shared. I mean, like people who saw Death of Superman, you know, in the reprint form, you know, will, will also have that nostalgia. You know, if they really liked it, they'll have that nostalgia or if a parent shared it with them, with their kids or something. So that's that kind of keeps these things alive to a degree. I mean, whether it's a TV show or not, or whether it's used in a TV show, it probably gives it more longevity. It doesn't necessarily mean it's better or worse. You know what I mean? Um, it, but it, but being a, a TV property probably gives it, again, if whatever, Stargirl is on now, well, maybe in, in 20 years, Stargirl will be an established iconic character that will be in a movie or something because the audience that's watching it now is maybe 15 years old and you know in 20 years they'll be in a position of power to either create a tv show or a movie or 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 something you know that's a great show be. sir it's that, a great show it it's is, a great I show i enjoy it a lot but i'm saying like it's like well i mean it's like looking at smallville like my kids were probably the right age when smallville was on 
so that would have been their experience with Clark Kent and, and you know, the not Superman, but Clark Kent. So Smallville has an impact in a way on them as they grow up the same way that maybe somebody else had some Superman thing or whatever. But uh, that, that part's fascinating to me. Again, I, you know, it used to be in the old days. I mean, and now there's a million TV channels around here. We got, there's more, more TV than you can even keep up with. You know, truly there's, you have Titans on uh, the HBO Max, you have Doom Patrol, you have the CW shows, The Flash, you have, you know, there's just so much. And that's just DC. You have other companies, you have other properties. It becomes almost overwhelming, you know, whereas when we were kids, when I was a kid, you didn't have a lot of choices. So when something like that, Marvel superheroes or Batman happened, it was like, oh, my God, you know, this is just for me. <laughs> you know? uh, well, uh, Jerry, what do you think about the, the Marvel TV series from Disney Plus? I've liked all of them. I've, I think they uh, they've been really good. And in, some, in ways, they've been good, better than because, again, they have multiple hours to spend on it. They're they're a little bit better than the movies as far as making you care about some of the characters. Um, I honestly felt like the Scarlet Witch and the Vision were kind of not that exciting, you know. Um, they were they didn't really they, they they didn't seem to have the personality or whatever. But watching the series, I suddenly cared about them, you know. And it's just a it's kind of like a symptom of being in a a, a group movie like Avengers or Justice League or whatever is that you're not going to get screen time to do much characterization with with uh, any to any degree that would make you feel like, oh, this character is special. Um, but I got that feeling, too. I was thinking about this as an example. The uh, extended version of the Justice League, the Snyder Cut, um, which was like four hours long or whatever. Uh, did, did you see it? Did you see it? Yeah, I did. I loved it. I mean, you to it. me, what I loved about it was that it's all the stuff that you know they have to cut for a movie because of runtime. There was a lot of really great character stuff for almost all the characters had extra extra emotional bits the flash especially cyborg especially i mean there was just a lot that that you lost and uh, i think it enhanced it although again it could have been a three-hour movie you know they could have probably cut that easily enough into a two-hour 40 minute uh runtime that could still run in a movie theater um but it was at the time it came out it was kind of a victim of politics to a degree not not politics politics but studio politics because uh warner brothers was being bought by at&t and you know there's other stuff going on behind the scenes that are above my pay grade but you you know i've read about them in the years since um hmm. And a lot of it has to do with showing if someone's going to buy your company, you want your company to look as profitable as possible. And your company is going to look better to someone buying them, buying you, if you don't have another $300 million movie to make in a year's time. In other words, those are all like negative things that um, someone's looking at books and ledgers or whatever. So, I mean, I think... Justice League got cut to a single film. It, it was like a bad situation all around. They cut it to a run time that they could make multiple showings and hopefully make more money. Um, it was just, it got caught in that sense, in, in a political kind of like a, you know, office politics on a larger scale. Um, but I still, I still stand by it. I still think, I think it's a, it was a great, I, was, I really enjoyed it. It was a great presentation. I really loved uh, Henry Cavill as Superman. I loved all the all the actors in those parts. Um, it's kind of sad that they were pretty much done at that point. Uh, I would have loved to have seen a Ben Affleck Batman movie. Um, I would love to see Henry Cavill in another Superman movie. Uh, it's kind of a shame, but, you know, again, there's not much as a, a viewer you can't you can you can't really make them do something you know um 
but it would be nice. It would be cool to see them, even if they could do, like if, if Warner Brothers was was able to to do Justice League 2 as an eight-part series on HBO Max, you know? I mean, it feels kind of like with the success of, of a show like The Boys on Amazon, oh. that was like a huge show for them. You know, The Boys is basically Justice League, <laughs> you know? It's like yeah, you, indeed. DC's sitting yes. on that. I, I just don't, I don't <laughs> quite understand it. I mean, I understand like maybe budget wise it would be expensive, but uh, you know they spend tons of money on these shows, anyways. You know, uh, I, I think I just think I think the audience would be there. I was very excited. I was excited to see Dark Side. I was excited. I thought the, you know, the movie itself would have, as a movie. Not, I know he filmed like the the extra added end end scenes, kind of because he knew this was his last chance with the characters, and he wanted to do the post apocalyptic Batman and you know Joker scene and things like that. If the movie ended at the end of the Justice League adventure, where you know they take care of the bad guy, and then you see Clark Kent pulling his shirt open and that type of thing, it would have been that would have been a theatrical cut. You know? uh, Jerry, black suit or uh, and the, at, the, at that end of the scene, black suit or the the regular suit? I think they could have gotten away with the black suit. And, and again, it would have been, to me, it felt like, you know, you wear black when you're in mourning. Maybe when you wear black when you come back from the dead. <laughs> maybe, he has, maybe he has a period of time where he has to get over that. I don't know. Um, I can't second guess that because I don't really know what his motivation for it was, but it looked cool. You know, the black suit looked cool. Um, I just, again, there's so many, I have so many emotions involved with that, that kind of, uh, I, I felt like for the last several years, I've been uh, standing up for the, those movies and a lot of fans don't like it. And I understand not everybody likes everything and not everybody likes the same type of things. But uh, I felt like there was a lot there that people kind of, they just, it became kind of a punching bag and, and Snyder became a bit of a punching bag and, uh, you know, okay, we're going to dump on this guy now because he doesn't get it or whatever. But I think he got it. I think, you know, you can't, there's no, no way for us to know what went on between him and Warner Brothers when he was first outlining his universe, you know. I mean, they basically entrusted him to create a, a universe on the on the run, basically, because they didn't have the build that Marvel did. They wanted to get to Justice League fast. And uh, I mean, I kind of I'm glad that they finally released his version of it uh, of while he was still able to do it and add, you know, finish the special effects and things. Uh, it would have been like when Richard Donner did the director's cut for uh, yeah. Superman 2. You know, yeah. by that time, they couldn't refilm scenes with Christopher Reeve and they couldn't, you know, uh, it was all, it was kind of hampered by that, even though it was interesting to watch it as a thing. It's interesting to watch. But here you had an example where the director was there, the footage still existed, and what they didn't have finished, they could finish and add some money to finish it. Um, it was the best scenario. I mean, I don't see why they wouldn't do, and again, I'm not trying to be controversial, on Twitter and places like that, people hate you if you you talk about this. But I would love to see what David Ayer's Suicide Squad would have been. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm totally for that because what it, what what's the what would it hurt? You know, the HBO Max needs content. They're probably spending big bucks to get series on. They've already got this stuff. They've got footage that they left on the cutting room floor. It would be fun just to see them put it together as a new thing. Why not? You you know, maybe, Jerry. You know, maybe, uh, sorry. Maybe it could be announced uh, on DC Fandom. Maybe I think it. I mean, a lot of people really. It's funny because like the the release the Snyder Cut movement. Uh, I was all for it, but I will admit that a lot of the people on there were pretty rude. And they could be very obnoxious, as obnoxious as the people who were against it. So it became 
probably more adversarial than it needed to be. But um, I think I don't see any downside to, you know, people look at it as, oh, this movement, they were a bunch of jerks and they won. Why is Warner giving into them? The point to me is they're doing it. They're giving Snyder a chance to put the movie out that he wanted to put out and that that's going to benefit the actors. The actors all signed on for that movie. They didn't sign on for the one that was released, you know, in theaters. So, you know, it feels like everybody gets a a shot to here's why I want to be Batman, because this is where his story arc was going to go. Here's why I wanted, you know, here's what I what I was told Wonder Woman was going to be or whatever, you know. So I think with in Suicide Squad, I thought the Batman scenes with that Deadshot. Yeah, great. They were great. And uh, um, totally the Joker might have come off differently if we had more of his character. You know, I mean, he was annoying, but he was really cut down to just a couple of scenes. I think it would have been, it, I'd be willing to watch something to see what uh, what performance they cut out. Um, and again- also, it, was, it was like a, 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 like a, um, a bridge between the Batman versus Superman right. and uh, the Justice League. Yeah. It was yeah. supposed to be a bridge because yeah. uh, what they say mm-hmm. is is that the real bad guy was Steppenwolf at yeah. the end. Mm-hmm. And that makes sense. And you can see it. I mean, when you when you watch the movie and you know that, it makes sense because they did look like parademons, you know, at the end. There was it just... I understand them making changes like that. I just think like for them to kind of change the tone of it, you know, I don't know if you know much of this, but you know, the, they did a, the trailer that for suicide squad was cut by the guys who did the guardians of the galaxy trailer. So basically they sold, they, they sold a movie that really wasn't the movie that the guy was making, but the audience, everybody loved that vibe from that trailer and it was like, oh well, let's make the movie more like that. So I, I it mean, was it was the trailer from with the Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, yes, song. that the was. Song. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was very very upbeat and very quick cuts and very funny and it could still be that, um, but it but it did feel kind of like that was the cause or the reason why maybe the Warner Brothers, you know, decided to re-edit for a punchier, you know, more Guardians of the Galaxy kind of feel or whatever. But, uh, and I, speaking of that, I really love the James Gunn's Guardians. I mean, uh, Suicide, Suicide, Suicide Squad. Suicide Squad. I really enjoyed <laughs> yeah. that. It was, I, I, it was but, kind of the Guardians of the Galaxy from I, this I, year. I, I really it. I really liked enjoyed it. Did you, enjoyed. did you like it or you didn't like it? Me? I, I Two things, you, two things. I really like I really liked the the Snyder Cut. I really I love it. Just one thing I didn't like from the from the Snyder Cut that was uh, how they uh, punished Steppenwolf at the end. That was oh. for, for me it was totally unnecessary. It was like okay, let's push it through the boom tube and that's all. And let's. <laughs> Let uh, Dark Side uh, kill him. That's all. It wasn't necessary. The 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 um, the, uh, the, the stabbing, the stabbing, the decapitation. It was totally necessary. But what I really liked about the um, Suicide Squad from James Gunn was I didn't I didn't like the movie as a whole. But what I did, what I did like, was I got the chance to see on screen a lot of a lot of things that I wouldn't thought I would see. For example, Starro. That yeah. was something that exploded in my mind. Like, whoa! <laughs> I didn't see Starro on the big screen, man. It's <laughs> yeah, it was kind of crazy. For me, for me, uh, I, I I enjoyed Suicide Squad. Uh, I don't. I didn't like the 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 thing with who who kills <laughs> Starro, right? Oh. But uh, but I I realized that they they did uh, 
brilliant adapted uh, the the Ostrander characters. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I really enjoyed that. But um, I think uh, the, the Snyder cut. Uh, I didn't enjoy it so much because it's too long. The yeah, length is, is yeah. from four hours, and I think I think uh, when when a director has to explain the the movie via Twitter. I think right. it's a bad movie because they didn't understand the movie, and I I, I don't. Uh, that's my my opinion, well, of course, sir. My only but, what I would the only defense I would say is that I think he he was originally going to just do a movie movie, and then yeah. Warner Brothers wanted it to as a four part, like a series, and I think that's where he started adding footage into it. Because it basically was going to be four separate episodes or four, you know, like streaming parts, and mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that they probably gave him money, there was like, okay, can we get more content out of it? It it felt it did feel like there's more in there than you need, you know. I mean, but I don't hold that against him because I think, again, you don't know what the what are the conditions. No one's going to say, no, of course, do what you want. Uh you know what i'm saying like i think i think he could easily and he'd even mention this that he could he could have cut that to like two hours and 30 two hours and for the minutes, minutes yes if it was going to be a theatrical release but because it was going to be on the streaming thing where presumably somebody could just pause it or come back to it the next mm -hmm. day then you know warner brothers just wanted the extra content so because you, you, mean, know, I, you know you know i love to i love to 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 continue the saga of of Fighting with the with with dark side and everything else, and I I think that it's uh, it's too the, the 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 scenes of the nightmare and the future and the darkness and everything is too much for me. Yeah, I think I would love to to do a, a like the comic book a, yeah. a real a real combat between the good and evil. Yeah, I think no, that, I, that's my I, opinion. I agree. I, I didn't like the, that's what I said. Like the the I especially. I could have done without the end scene of the future, or the the dark, you know, desert world where Superman's bad or whatever. Mm. I mean, I could have done without that, but I think that's in there because he set it up in Batman versus Superman. So it's kind of like this is as close as I'm going to get to resolving this. Um, I actually, mm -hmm. it's funny though. I really thought as because I saw I watched this the four hour cut my friend Mitch and I got invited, somebody rented out a theater and they streamed uh -huh. the HBO max on a big screen. And oh, we actually whoa. sat in our audience and we watched it. Great. And I remember the, the, the sequence that, that, uh, where basically they take care of uh, Steppenwolf. Just, <laughs> I thought it was really nicely done. It's dark, but it was really nicely done as, the head goes through the. I thought that was cool. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, me too. It's it cool. was like you know, Dark Side's about to be like, here's yeah, I'm gonna get some success, and then like, there's the guy's head or whatever. I just thought that was good, but also that's that's like motivation for another movie. In other words, yeah. if that happened to you, or if you were Dark Side, you would go, I'm not gonna let this stand. <laughs> you know, no, I'm, I'm going with all go the go. army. <laughs> I'm going to destroy everything. <laughs> it's like you give give them more reason to go kick some butt. Yes, Earth of course. Whatever, but, yeah. Um, but well, yeah, anyway, so I'm, I'm I haven't seen much for the, you know, the the Flash looks intriguing. Uh, ben Affleck apparently was talking about how much fun he had playing Batman in the Flash, and he said, you know, he was saying it was much more fun than the experience of Justice League, but Justice League was. <laughs> probably really torture for all those guys when they had to go back to you know refilm stuff so jerry we must say that that is directed by an argentinian oh. <laughs> the flash uh, <laughs> so the flash and the mochetti <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's it's going to be fun <laughs> i don't even know who the director is of the who is the director Andy Muschietti, he directed it. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So I didn't realize he, he's Argentinian. Yes. Oh, cool. Well, good for you guys. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of that's kind of exciting, right? 
Let's let's wait till the movie goes out. <laughs> <laughs> let's wait till the movie goes out. Then we, we so. celebrate <laughs> and we and, and then we you can, can say it's Argentinian, it's Argentinian. <laughs> We hope so. <laughs> Jerry, uh, I, I wanted to ask you something uh, before that I I forgot when you spoke about uh, working at DC and all this uh, all this uh, uh, difficult work uh, every week uh, trying to fit the schedule and there was uh, some kind of team bonding activity you you guys uh, did to relax to to unite the group well we whenever we would get together they always we always had group dinners and things like that um we we had fun i mean here's the thing in uh, i think it was in 89 might have been 88 i can't remember what year it was that we um, we went to, to, uh, Florida in, um, for our Superman meeting and we got to be on the Superboy TV show. So that was, that was kind of fun because we were all extras on an episode of the Superboy, uh, TV show that was filming in Orlando at the, um, Universal Studios there. And, um, so we, that was kind of, that kind of becomes a bonding thing. And then a couple of years later, we went to, uh, it was after the death of Superman, we were on the set of Lois and Clark on the, the pilot episode of Lois and Clark. And again, as a group, we, we had fun as, I mean, we, you know, when we were working on stories, we didn't always agree on stuff. I mean, we had our disputes and stuff, but we were, we were all friends. Um, and I think that was a big part of everybody having the same goal and everybody having the same kind of vision of Superman. You know, there wasn't uh, any major disagreements about who Superman was or what the character meant or any of those things. So, um, but we, one of the earlier ones, and I think it was during the, when we had to come back and redo the death of Superman, we had, we'd been in, in New York and I think I've been corrected on this because memory is a little tricky my memory of this was different and I will admit that I didn't remember it correctly, but apparently the first day of the, our, of our Superman conference story conference, we did it at DC in the, in their conference room and we plotted out the wedding. And that was going to be the big event for Superman 75, uh, the Lois and Clark, you know, getting married. And, you know, so we did the big chart for all that stuff. And then this at night, Jeanette Kahn had got tickets for all of us to go see cats, which we we're all like, you know, like, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was, okay. it was fun. It wasn't okay. a show, but it was fun. And she, the fact that she liked it enough that she wanted us to see it, you know, that was fine. Cause she was really, she was like an extraordinary, uh, uh, editor in chief publisher whatever her job was she really was a, a really good leader for dc um but anyway so the next day we came in and mike carlin says you're all going to be mad at me but uh lois and clark the tv show may want to do the wedding on the show and we really should hold back on it because if we do it more in conjunction with the tv show we'll get that bump from what's going on with the tv show so we were all a little mad, and that's how the death of Superman came about on that second day. Um, you know, it was just kind of like a little bit of anger, maybe, and a little bit of, oh, we, did, we spent a whole day, we thought we'd accomplished a lot of work, and then we have to start over. Because we couldn't put the, de the wedding even on that chart. You know, the wedding. I know, no so we went to see cats. <laughs> and we saw cats. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, but those are I mean, the, in a way that also is a bonding thing, because, you know, ultimately, I think we I initially thought this was coming from D.C. or from maybe Warner Brothers. And ultimately, it was Mike Carlin and he was just thinking ahead. So he was thinking, uh, you know, 
this is a good opportunity to do something where the TV show will help us promote it. And you have to think of it. The other thing, it, it's you can't think of this as happening after the death of Superman. It happened before the death of Superman was even a thing when we were still struggling to try to get new readers. So it wasn't unheard of for us to go, okay, this makes more sense because if it's a network TV show, it's potentially got millions of viewers and it's going to be promoted. Whereas we have no promotion. There's no promotion budget for DC to do the, you know, promote a story like that. So it totally made sense within that, you know, time frame. Uh, and, and ultimately it gave us a, a, it gave us our goal, which was to make Superman popular again, um, coming out of something that's, you know, uh, was kind of like, said you can't do this you have to do that or you have to do something different so i mean it's kind of funny <laughs> Kill there's so many elements of that that were were random you know that uh somehow added and made that thing a success beyond what any of us could have imagined it to be so i mean that's all those little random things in the universe that you can't account for you know um the fact that some newspaper would pick up on the story when it was just in the initial rumor stage almost you know would pick up on that story and that story would snowball by virtue of what a slow news day or or something like that so yeah it's it's kind of amazing i almost uh, remember uh, being a, a kid and watching tv and watching the story and the, the story was uh, superman is gonna die and it's gonna be killed by this mysterious billion that uh, appears from nowhere. Uh, and I was like, it's going to die. I was a kid. Imagine this. Imagine this. I was a kid. I wasn't reading comics uh, a lot uh, in that in that era, so I I didn't under understand the, this this. Um, the rules of comics that right right it would it, it would come back but i didn't know yeah. so it was a total shock i remember a total shock and yeah, me too and when i and i i first read it it was a totally powerful totally, it, it was a powerful message that delivered uh, the the comic yeah. and 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 the whole saga and the whole saga it's Today, I think it's one of the best uh, Superman sagas uh, ever written, ever written. Yes. I was, and it's perfectly uh, plotted, and it, it has its moments, and it's it's one of my favorites. It's I, I always say that the that saga was the the saga that began my comic book collection. I began com uh, collecting comics about uh, that era with the death of Superman. You know. Well, you know, what's funny is what you're mentioning about, I was not a big DC fan. Um, so I didn't realize that they'd done a lot of imagine. They even did the imaginary story, the death of Superman in the, like the 1950s or 1960 or something. So, I mean, the concept was in a lot of those imaginary stories. And when we were all coming around with this idea and I kind of threw it off as a joke, you know, about let's kill him. <laughs> you know, because it was a running gag, you know, uh, just to end the chart, like everyone dies, the end, you know, as on the charts. So, <laughs> you know, you know, I gotta say something, Jerry. Uh, when we spoke with Joe, Joe, uh, John Bogdan, know, he said you were you weren't joking. <laughs> <laughs> he said he he well, was very serious about it. <laughs> no, no, he was not joking. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I mean, honestly, I think uh, it was it, the way the story came up and the way the the whole thing came up. It was like, you know, I remember it differently, and we all remember it a little bit differently. I remember Carlin making that comment at one point, saying, "Well, maybe this is the time where he actually does really die," and I kind of almost believed that version of it because I remember thinking, "Wait, how can we kill this guy?" You know, and then Roger Stern said, well, we don't know what death is to a Kryptonian. And I went, oh, and, you know, we, we had all experienced the uh, 
the death of Spock in the Star Trek movies, which had a big impact, even though I was already an adult at that point, it was very, you know, moving and everything. So uh, I kind of, I, I was having a hard time wrapping my brain around it once we started talking about it as a real thing. It was like, wait, well, how would you really do this? And that, I, I remember using a lot of brain power trying to think of ways to, uh, you know, before we plotted out the return, like, how would this actually work? Is he dead? Is he like in, you know, again, is he in some kind of kind of uh, turned off mode or whatever? I mean, he's kind of a solar battery. Has that got something to do with it? one of the ideas that I pitched, which was not a, at all accepted? <laughs> I didn't I didn't get my way on, that, on a lot of these things anyways, but I had said, wouldn't it be interesting if Superman dies, right? What if in after a period of a couple months, you resume the book or you, you lead into the book by having him show up with the Legion of Superheroes and you realize that he's actually been transported, you know, into the future by the, the force of the, the, the punch or whatever. Somehow he's, you know, and they were like, nah, that's, you're making it too, too complicated. <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> I was trying to, you know, because I was thinking it would be kind of interesting you know, in that way to have a character, uh, you know, it's like, okay, but they didn't want to back off on the fact that he was technically dead, which I understand too. Um, so that's where the, the idea of having uh, Pa Kent basically almost make himself ill enough to be on death's door for him to go into the, you know, uh, limbo and find his, his adopted son and bring him back. I mean, that kind mm -hmm. of, uh, I think that story, I was raised Catholic, you know, I don't know if that has anything to do with things, but I remember, you know, hearing about the, uh, the afterlife and, you know, there was a place called Limbo, which was not, it was neither heaven or earth or whatever. And um, so a lot of those, those things did kind of play in, but they just came around in a different way. Um, but I, again, I think back on it now, I remember like with the return of Superman, one of the things, one of the aspects of it that I used, it makes sense in a way too, because I remember uh, seeing the movie Somewhere in Time with Christopher Reeve. And I remember like being, I remember him, like the idea of him actually dying in that movie almost like by, because he couldn't get back to the woman he loved. That was like thinking about like, wow, who would do that? That just seems so extreme. So I think that actually occurred to me a little bit when I was doing the, the pot or thinking of the pot can stuff, you know, was, was he, his health was getting worse, but he was actually making it worse himself, you know? Um, but yeah, it was, it was an interesting time. Again, a lot of the, I think a lot of attention is focused on the actual death stuff. And until recently, they hadn't even reprinted the entire, you know, funeral for a friend world without Superman, all that stuff. So this last omnibus that they put out actually for the first time had all those other mm. stories in which was good because, uh, again, that felt like that was the meat of the, of the story and the, uh, the reason for doing it anyways. But, uh, Jerry, I, I want to ask you a question. If you are going to, if someday you're working for Marvel, which character do you want to kill? <laughs> Would I want to kill? <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got some ideas. Spider Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so mean. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I honestly, it's funny though. It's funny that that's anybody who knows me would think that that's just not something I would do. I'm not like somebody who I always tend to to uh, respect the characters, and you know, I think I may be too respectful of them to to try to do something that big with with any character. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I don't think I would ever. I wouldn't have killed Superman on my own. You know what I mean? I think it was. It was kind of something that came mm -hmm. out of the whole story discussion as opposed to just coming in and saying, yes, he must die. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I, I, I like to... Marvel characters. I was thinking, like, who who would you kill in the Marvel universe? You know, I mean, who do you who do you like the least that you think would benefit from from people missing? <laughs> they killed Tony Marvel. Stark, so <laughs> <laughs> who can I die in the Marvel universe? Because <laughs> yes. if you if you got, got the same Spider Man. Doctor Strange, Iron Man, yeah. Captain America, B Bucky. <laughs> yeah, Captain America. Captain years. America would have an impact, you know? Yeah. I mean, Captain America is kind of similar in some ways as su to Superman in that they're kind of both idealized, um, you know, good guys. So, but I I, I, I just think that's, that's a funny question. I would not want to kill any other character. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I will I will I will talk, tell you another fact, a fun fact. Here in Argentina, we have a a, a problem with a, a character, with the Flash. You know, uh, when uh, the run of Mike Barron, uh, the Flash from Wally West, they they published here in Argentina, Editorial Perfil, and they couldn't. Uh, they couldn't put the title, The Flash. You know why? Because there was a, a gossip uh, magazine called Flash. Oh. <laughs> so they altered the title and they put here Flashman. <laughs> <laughs> like a flash, you know, <laughs> you go to the bathroom, <laughs> Flashman. They put it That's Flashman. Funny. And it, it's... It's a lot of stories about. Uh, do they still Flash, do Flashman. that, or do they? No, still... no, no, not anymore, not anymore. But they have the run from forty pages <laughs> for yeah, forty yeah. numbers. Here oh, you got it. Funny. Here you Flash got it. <laughs> Flashman. <laughs> that is funny. Well, when when my kids were really little, and we would come up, we would play around with drawing. Um, we always did a lot of drawing together. That was like a good activity when they were all pretty little. And uh, sometimes I would start a drawing. I would do a couple of shapes. And then the, the game we played was that you had to pass it on to the next person to add something to it. So I would do maybe a, a head or a body. And then somebody would draw onto it and somebody would draw onto it until it you know, went through the three kids. And it was usually, you know, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we used to do that. We used to come up with superhero characters too, from their perspective. And uh, one that sticks with me was thinking of the Flash. It was Fasty Man, F like fast, <laughs> Fasty Man. Fasty. And I just always thought that had such a weird rhythm, but such a a little kid kind of kind of kind of sound to it. He wasn't. He was the fastest man alive. He was Fasty Man. <laughs> Because <laughs> when I was a kid, I came up, I mean, I had my own, you know, fake characters too. And I did Shield Man, and I did Rubber Man, and I did the Acrobat. Those were my three. And then the Messenger came a little bit later. But, um, you know, they were all like knockoffs of the Captain America and Mr. Fantastic. And uh, I even had like a Wonder Woman type character, but she was Gallant Girl. And I never even understood if it worked. Like, can I, could she be gallant? Wasn't that like a male thing? Or was it, you know? <laughs> but, uh, so Flash, Flash Man sounds really funny. It just kind of has that almost like a little kid sounding <laughs> title to me. <laughs> Flash Man. It he, was amazing. Here are the, the, messenger. the, mentioned, the messenger. Yes. And you, you did this, um, you did this, um comic book with Bill and the Mayo that were the the ones from um the um, the writers from the Flash yes. uh, series. And they wrote the Rocketeer movie too. Oh. oh yeah they that was a that was a fun project. They were very uh pretty cool guys. I knew the I worked more with Paul DeMeo than uh um uh, Bilson, but uh, they were fun. There was a that was a really fun project. Again, it fit really well with that time frame. And that at, when we were working on it, when I first started on it, there was a it was one of those that was had a probably a, an eighty percent chance of being a TV show. It was uh, it was very because the other part of I think 
Adam Brody was the third um, creator, and Adam Brody yeah. was on uh, Gossip Girl or one of those shows at the time with, I think, Danny Bilson's daughter, Rachel Bilson, was also on that show. So there was like a whole, it was all connected, but so they actually had some kind of deal that it, it came really, really close, I guess, to becoming a pilot for a oh. show. It was almost option, but it, you know, almost doesn't count. And the minute that the, that, that went away, the promotion for the sh comic just totally dropped, <laughs> you know, <they're, laughs> DC and everybody was really high on it. And, uh, it was going to be, you know, oh, we're going to promote the heck out of it. It's going to be a big thing and everything. And then the minute the, you know, whatever TV or movie option idea had fallen through, it just came out and I don't think it got a whole lot of promotion. It was, a, but it's a fun story. I think it was well done. Again, set within a historical um, context of the 1950s and the, uh, the communist, uh, the Red Scare and all that. And even has a, a real life bad guy in there. <laughs> did, you <ever> see, <laughs> did you see the the story or, or the comic or did you saw just the cover? just the covers? Just, just the covers. Cover. Yeah, it was cool. It was kind of kind of neat. It was like a, a patriotic character is called before the Senate committee, you know, uh, investigating communists, and he was like a Captain America kind of character who's suddenly being, you know, having his reputation dragged through the mud. Uh, based on found, you know, unfound rumors and stuff like that. But the bad guy uh, is actually a real life guy. He was he was uh, Joseph McCarthy was the senator? Oh yes. And uh, oh, so it was a real guy. But then his uh, his aide, <clears throat> which uh, I almost don't know, <laughs> uh, his aide was uh, somebody who was Donald Trump's lawyer in. Uh, in your, you know more recent years before he passed away, uh, I, I don't. Even, I'm not going to mention his name. <laughs> but it's okay. Anyway, it's okay. It's a good story. Don't mention it. Was it. A really good story. Um, oh yes, he was a villain, yeah. a real, <laughs> real life villain. <laughs> here in Argent, here in Argentina, uh, uh, it wasn't published. It was published in Spanish by Editorial Norma. Oh, okay. And it was published in I think it's in two, in two prestige. In prestige oh, okay. form. Yeah, it was. I think it was a five-issue series, and um, it was fun to work on. It was definitely a lot of fun. And I, I mean, I've I've been lucky in that way. I mean, I've worked on stuff that I think I feel like the stories were all pretty decent. I don't think I've done anything um, that I've worked on that I felt was kind of like a crappy story. I mean, I got to work with uh, Alan Moore on stuff on some Tom Strong stories, and, and I worked. I did once Tom Strong story with Michael Moorcock, which was really fun. Um, I did uh, a planetary JLA thing with Warren Ellis. That was really uh, a lot of fun. And again, you know, <clears throat> sometimes you, uh, you know, I don't think I've ever done a story that I thought was really terrible. You know what I mean? As far as working with a writer or whatever, generally uh, I've lucked out in that sense that uh, I think most of the stuff you put a lot of work into it, whether it's good or bad, ultimately, you know, and it's nice to know that when stuff is finished, you read it and you go, oh, that, that actually holds up as a story. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, again, I've been doing the, you showed Proton and Messenger. The, I've been doing the, uh, some self-published stuff. And I just, uh, I have a, I just did the second issue of Proton that I've been mm -hmm. doing self-publishing and I'm just, I'm trying to do some of the characters that I worked on when I was a kid, you know, and they're mm -hmm. reimagined. They're, they're not the same as what I did when I was a kid, but they're all, uh, Oh, you know, they're at this point, they're all black and white. I'm trying, I'm doing like, I'm trying to kind of trick myself into doing, 10 page, 11 page chapters so that I have enough at some point that I can collect and maybe do a Kickstarter to do it in color. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, Jerry, just be Jerry, I, I saw in your page that uh, the, messen the messenger story, uh, it's connected with Proton. 
because yeah. I, I saw it was like uh, Messenger 23. You continue the, the story that began with that issue yeah. I showed. Yeah. Yeah, it's like mm -hmm. I made a mistake in a way because in I did the Messenger, the I did a, a uh, I want to say it was a 64, maybe it was a 48 page uh, one shot back with image in like 1999. And I had planned at that point I was going to do Proton right after that. And then it didn't happen because I just couldn't, I, I wound up, I mean, you know, I had to, my kids were little and I couldn't take time and work for free, even if it was for my own stuff. I just, it didn't happen. So, but I'd planned this thing with in the messenger story with a direct tie into the proton thing. So when I resumed doing the proton, I had drawn like, I think 10 or 11 pages of a proton, the beginning of it back in 2002. And then I resumed it in 2017 because I was going to comic conventions more often. And I, I felt like I could sell it at shows. It was something to sell. So, um, and it was, a you know, again, a reason to try to get myself working on this story again. And I started drawing the next chapter of it. And then at a certain point I went, I better go back and reread that messenger story. Cause that, at that point that was 1998 or something. So I reread the messenger thing and it was like, Oh, thank God I read it because I forgot <laughs> that I'd had this direct, <laughs> the direct tie-in. But it also then makes the story is set without saying it. The story visually is supposed to be set like around 2000. So uh, um, I just have to keep in mind not to show everybody talking on a cell phone and and stuff like that. Um, but it's kind of fun. Again, it's it's a lot of these things they wind up being a little bit like puzzles because. You know, you, you come up with pieces of it with the idea that they're going to fit together at some point. But then a lot of times they change so much, you know, like you'll you'll have a new idea that, oh, this is a good idea. That I'm going to do this. And then you have to figure out how it's still somehow you can still put that puzzle piece that connects it to the, the piece that you did years ago. So uh, but I'm getting I'm actually I, I, I did. I think 11 or 12 pages this last year, which I was very proud that I got that done because that's 11 or 12 pages that I wouldn't have done normally if I didn't push myself. So um, I felt like I had some momentum. I just have a hard time when I have to stop and start because I stop to do commissions or a cover or something like that. And then I lose my momentum, whatever, you know, I had going there because it's hard to shift gears for me from doing an interior storytelling to doing like a picture, you know, an individual. I just, it's always been hard to, to switch back and forth um, quickly or seamlessly. It always takes me a while to get going on either, either of those uh, kind of disciplines. And uh, Jerry, to end, to end the interview, I want to show some art yours. This I think it one is a commission. Yeah, one is the first one. The, the, the first, first one is one's a, a commission I did a couple of years ago with the Flash and Super. I mean, with the, playing off of the Superman <laughs> Flash race with Shazam, yes. Captain Marvel. Second one was a cover from my days on Superman, intro, reintroducing Terra Man, I guess. And then the third one was done for Wizard Magazine back in 1998 or seven or eight. And they've used it for their, they used to have a big banner that they had above their shows when they did comic book shows, they used it. It was also the cover of the Wizard Superman special that they yeah. did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, um, the Superman cover is from the Time and Time Again saga. If I, Which one? You mean the middle one? The middle the, one. No, I think that was a. I don't know. I feel like that was a standalone story with Terra Man. Um, I, that's why I, I, my memory of it, at least, is that it was because I think it wasn't a time travel story. So I think I think it wouldn't have been part of the time unless it was reprinted in the collection. It's possible. Um, well, yeah, Jerry, it was. Fun. I mean, that was a character that everybody, uh, Terra Man. Everybody kept saying. When are we going to see Terra Man after the the Superman relaunch? And I kept asking Mike Carlin, why does why do people want Terra Man? 
and we couldn't figure it out. <laughs> and then I realized at one point it was uh, it was one of the few things that Neil Adams had done for the Superman books. He had done like a Terra Man, like a short story or something that he had either inked it. I don't know if he penciled it, but I think he inked it. And for some, there's always a fan of some character. Even if you don't think you never heard of it, there's somebody out there is going to like the character, no matter which character it is. So um, I just decided, since they kept asking for it, I thought Terra Man would be a good name for a guy who was like an eco, eco warrior, you know? someone who was worried about the world and the, the climate and everything else. Well, uh, Jerry, we're going to thank you a lot, a lot for such a wonderful time we spent with you. Well, thank uh, you. It, it's a real pleasure. It's a real pleasure to, to, to have, to, to speak with you, to have you here and to uh, hear all the amazing stories you had to tell we well, love to, we really, say, really love to have the opportunity to, to speak to a uh, i guess it's also a different audience in a way right i mean you're are you mostly because you, most of the things that popped up as far as um the viewers or whatever were were they all argentina or were they all over right yeah yes yeah yeah, that's that's uh, one of the things that I do when when the the interview uh, got uh, like um, turns Finish. into a video turns into a video when we finish the interview, I put subtitles for oh, the cool. Argentinian to to read to they understand the English and yeah. for the English people to hear it, yes. like we, if. If they understand our English, <laughs> our English. <laughs> I understand you perfectly. <laughs> Jerry, thank you so much to be here tonight with us. Thank and you. as I always say, you you and, and all your colleagues are the real heroes. You are Superman, you are Shazam, you are every single character that you work on it, you are one of this. So thank you so much. Oh, My first you. comic book was one of yours, was Batman, the adaptation oh, of, the, of the movie, thank of the comic much. book. So I, no, thank you, sir. Thank you, <laughs> sir. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you, it's, sir. For it's, great, this it's, gratif it's gratifying to me to have, I mean, again, the characters that I worked on seem to have a, kind of a universal uh, appeal, you know, and I'm always kind of humbled by the fact that the uh, the work, I mean, the stuff I've done has been, you know, printed in so many different countries in so many different editions. I mean, that, that kind of is very mind blowing because I just never envisioned that as a kid. You know, I always thought I wanted to be a comic book person, but I didn't know how I would do it or whether it would happen, you know, but it's, <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty humbling to think that these characters have such a kind of a, global reach you know but i think it's because they're heroes you know i mean the world needs heroes no matter you know when or where <laughs> yes yeah yes. and something that uh, mario said that you are the real heroes and something that i i was telling him before is that uh, people like you people like you have this aura around <laughs> that it 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 give you it's like i i don't know it's like comic book history comic <laughs> yes, book really comic book uh something that comic book fans loved loved mm -hmm. and can feel the the good vibes can can feel the 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 the, all the passion you did all with the passion, all the passion. Why do you draw everything? You put on on your comic books and and your uh, and your art, and that's that's how I said we, before uh, we start the interview. That's why we love Jerry Orway. Yes, of course. That's why we I love. Appreciate, it. I appreciate it. I mean, again, uh, I think it's it's it's. You know, I'm a fan of stuff. I still read comics. I still collect comics. I still go to the comic store. I still 
like stuff. I, I was telling you, though, the other time, too, I think, is that I find it really fascinating that so much of this is universal. You know, I mean, there's certainly specific things to American superhero comics, maybe a, a, a slightly different point of view. But ultimately, the idea of, of any kind of hero is somebody who helps people who need help, you know. That appeals to me. That always appealed to me from the time I was a little kid. So I think that's the the kind of bond that connects us all. Honestly, I think it it, it is. I think that's, you know, kind of a, a amazing amazing kind of thread that runs through most of comics, you know, fans and readers and stuff. Because I'm the same way. I mean, I, I had the same the the same appeal. You know, those characters I read when I was a kid. So. Uh, I mean, it's it's gratifying and it's it's very humbling. So thank you. Well, uh, we're gonna say goodbye, and I had a favor to ask you, if you can, if you want, you're not. Uh, but I would like to that you say your name, and that this is protagonista del comic. Say it again, though. What is it? Pro, how do you pronounce that? Pro, proten, protagonistas. Protagonistas. Comic, del, or, del comic. Del comic? Yes. Hi, I'm Jerry Ardway, and you're watching Protagonistas Del Comic, I think. <laughs> you know, and, and we go with this. With, with this. this. <laughs> with this. With this. Protagonistas Del Comic. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you again, Thanks Jerry. A, a pleasure. Take care, guys. Nos vemos. Nos vemos, gente. <laughs> Gracias por todo. Hasta luego. Y dejen su like y suscríbanse. Mm -hmm.